All right, it is 1230 on Friday, March 22nd, and I am calling the March meeting of Connecticut State Senate to order. Our first item of business is approving the agenda. Is there a motion? Sarah. I would like to actually request to move the bylaws to old business. Because we weren't able to uh, finish our discussion on election uh, uh, cycles. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Are there any objections? Any objections? Are there any other changes requested? Peter, are you asking for a change or was that just changing the screen? No, okay. Hearing no objections, the motion, the agenda is accepted as amended. Moving your attention to the February minutes. Is there a motion to accept the minutes as distributed? Roberta, oh, you're on mute. Is that a is it? motion to accept the minute? So, thank you. Is there a second? Second, Kirsten. Thank you, Kirsten. Any changes or discussion? Any edits to the minutes? Hearing no changes. Is, are there any objections to accepting the minutes as presented? Very good, we have accepted the minutes. So at this time in our meeting, folks, I would like to ask Nicola to share a few words prior to a moment of silence. Nick? So as the Connecticut State community is aware Three Rivers lost Alicia Ziegler over spring break. Um, it was a tragic, tragic car accident. Um, we had a celebration of her life here at Three Rivers last night, and there was well over a hundred people. Some of the people who are at this meeting were there last night also to celebrate Alicia with us. Um, I, I can tell you that she was such a force of nature. Um, she was such a voice for students and a staunch, one of the staunchest allies for the LBGTQ community and our students in general. Her, her passion for the students is just, I can't even express to you how much she cared and how tirelessly she worked at what she did here at Three Rivers. I mean, I, I knew her as a student and then it was my privilege to be able to know her as a fellow employee of Connecticut State and her loss is going to be felt by this community for a very, very, very long time. And I can tell you that our hallways shine that much less without her here. So she's she's going to be missed. I can't even express to you about how much. Thank you, Nick. We're gonna go ahead and observe a moment of silence in her honor. All right, folks, as we uh, 
Mm. Loss is hard. As we move our attention back to our agenda, I want to take a few minutes to recognize the work that is happening in statewide shared governance. The incredible dedication of the folks who are serving on Senate, but also the people who are working on our campuses. We have done a lot in the last year and a half, and we still have so much work left to do. But for those folks who aren't in our meetings, who aren't participating in our committees, they don't know the depth to which we try to understand the problems that we are facing and collaborate with administration to try to improve how we operate and the college that we are becoming because we are very much growing into ourselves. So we have elections coming up on our campuses for Senate in the next month. And I want to ask folks to talk to your campuses, share the work that we have done, the work that we are continuing to do, and encourage them to see shared governance as the vital part of Connecticut State that we are becoming. I also want to say that we are still in the process of responding to Governor Lamont's questions that he posed to the Connecticut State delegation. He had several questions he asked us, and as we sat down to try to respond to those questions, I realized that each of them in and of itself was an individual response. So at this time, we have responded only to Governor Ned Lamont's comparison to Post University. And in the near future, we will be responding to the remaining issues. After our meeting today, I will share our response or my response to Governor Lamont with the Senate. And, um, and then we will start working on the other open issues. So, if you if does anyone have questions for me before I go ahead and hand things over to President Maduka? When you say we, could you please say who is we? The so working on um, the response, Angelo. I worked with the executive council and the delegate, the delegates who attended the meeting with Governor Lamont, and that was. Uh, Vice President, I, and I have shared this in emails to, to all of you, but just to formally recognize that was the Vice President of Faculty, Nicola. Nick, is your last name Riker? Ricker? Ricker, there we go. Um, Vice President John Fiorello, hopefully I got that right. I'm usually on a first name basis. Um, Senator Sandra Vitelli from Tunxis and Senator uh, Alan Ballinger from Gateway. So you all did great work and, and they all helped with that. Thank you for the question, Alan. Um, Seth and then Alan. Hey, oh, thank you for the update. Uh, just a question um, that I have this within the update. Uh, what were the questions that, uh, what, what were the questions pulled by Governor Lamont? Oof. Seth, I don't have them off the top of my head, but I, uh, they are in the address that I will, or the email that I will forward to Senate later today. One, one is related to funding. Um, another is what can we do better? The, the one that I just responded to was a comparison to post. And if anybody from the delegation remembers that, that last question, please weigh in. Alan might be able to help me here. Alan? Uh, sorry. <laughs> No worries. I was going to mention the funding thing, but you know, when we left, he said this deserves a response. Has he responded to to us to you he, in any way? He has not, Alan. But what one of the reasons that I thought it was um, smart to break up the answers is to keep CT State 
um, at the forefront of his deliberations. So um, I have, I, I will continue to, to share my responses with the delegation and ask for feedback. Um, and I will be asking for that response. Thank you. All right, without further ado, President Maduko, thank you for your participation today. Yeah, good, uh, happy Friday uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, Professor Vandemark and Senators and Chancellor Chang. Uh, good seeing all of you. I actually was, uh, I attended the, uh, the Center of Teaching and Learnings. Um, uh, you know, they had a meeting today uh, in West Hartford. It was pretty awesome in terms of just working on uh, on leadership. So it was good to see some of you. I saw Ms. Sullivan, you were on there. So I think I beat you uh, to, to the start of the meeting. But again, just uh, really honored for the invite. Uh, let me share my, um, I'll share my screen. Um, uh, per feedback I've gotten from a whole bunch of you, like Maduka, you talk a lot, but we need visuals. So I said, okay, I'm going to provide visuals. But um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of my updates, uh, I wanted to kind of just share what's been going on uh, um, globally at CT State and some of the things in my world. So, Professor Riker, like you, you said it beautifully, and and my heart aches for um, um, for everyone uh, that knew and loved. Um, um, Alicia, um, I was there last night, uh, Professor Freeman, I, I saw you last night as well. Um, I think it was more, I think it was over 300 people because at one point it was standing room only, not only inside the room, but there was a line outside the multi-purpose room, but it was really beautiful. And the, uh, the examples that were shared regarding, uh, Alicia's life as a professional and as a, as a wife and a parent and a grandmother and a friend, uh, really reminds us why we're, um, you know, what we should be focused on inside and outside of our of our day to day here at CT State. So uh, I, I, I was happy and honored to join everyone. And as a college, we're, we're, we're going to rally around three rivers um, um, as long as necessary uh, to, to be with them every step of the way. Um, last weekend on Saturday, uh, I was invited to uh, celebrate the naming of the USS Idaho uh, at a christening and naming ceremony um, at uh, General Dynamic Electric Boats, boats um, um, site plant uh, in Groton. Uh, Senator Blumenthal was there. Uh, Congressman Courtney was there. Um, thousands of spectators and, and visitors. And it was awesome to hear, you know, two federal level um, legislators give a shout out uh, to CT State regarding, you know, our work in the manufacturing space and contributing to that. Uh, many of the electric boats executives were there and, you know, and again, they said that, you know, they need more of us as it, re as it relates to our students and our alumni. So really uh, an awesome moment to, to celebrate with a whole bunch of individuals and to speak to the value of our, of our faculty and our staff and what we do um, as an institution, specifically at Three Rivers and also at uh, Quinnebog, uh, Quinnebog Valley. Uh, we have a couple of executive search, um, um, one current, so the permanent Campus CEO for CT State Satonic is underway. Uh, the application um, period closes on the 29th. So if you know someone here or in Zambia, please let them know um, that we're seeking a permanent um, you know, CEO, but obviously a strong leader uh, for a great campus filled with great faculty and staff and students. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, we're working on finalizing the details uh, to launch the search of the permanent vice president of enrollment management. Uh, Dr. T uh, Tamika Davis has been serving in an interim capacity, and she's been doing great work. Um, but and she's eligible to apply for the permanent position. But we'll be doing a full wide night uh, national search um, for that role. VP of Enroll enrollment management is a big deal for CT State, uh, and we need some permanency in that role. Um, next, our legislative breakfast events. So, so far, we've had 11 out of 12 um, legislative breakfast. Uh, engagements uh, across our campuses. We have Quinnebog Valley's remaining, and I think that's uh, upcoming in a week or two. So it's an opportunity for us to to host um, our elected uh, officials, some members of the General Assembly, um, to to hear from us. So Chancellor Chang um, and, and myself, our campus CEOs, uh, presented um, to our guests, to our legislators, fa faculty, staff, and students on on from a system level. Um, in terms of an, an investment that we need to an institutional level, in terms of who we are as CT State, and then from a campus level, you know, points of pride, the things that we do well that are often 
um, missing or absent, let's, let's call it like it is, absent um, from the media. We're doing great things um, on the backs of our faculty and staff. So it was good to kind of share that with them. And we've been sharing um, some C our, 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 our newest edition, CT State Fast Facts. Um, so often, if you go to the main website of an institution of higher education, university, community college, and you click about, typically under the about tab, you know, you have a lot of inf general information about the institution. And typically, there's fast facts, if not linked to a, um, to a dashboard that you can see various um, KPIs, key performance indicators, uh, and data sets. So we're starting off with the fast facts, and it's been helpful. And, and the feedback we received from legislators um, and others is that I had no idea. I had no idea you guys served north, north than 70,000 students, right? I thought it was only 30,000, 40,000. I said, yeah, but we also have non-credit students and high school students. So in totality, it's north of 70,000 students. I had no idea you guys are 60% students of color. Yeah, we are a minority serving uh, institution. I had no idea you serve north of 8,118 dual enrollment high school students. Yeah, we are the second largest dual credit uh, provider, second only the Yukon, right? And we serve 181 high school partners, right? So on and on and on. And let me share you some, you know, some of the, you know, some of the slides um, that are, let me see. Let me see here, if I can advance the slide, let me just show you real quickly. Some of the data sets, got, so I think it's a really important, you know, so, you know, for one, you know, from a high quality education, you know, in terms of what we're doing for state of Connecticut, you know, on an annual basis, we serve nearly 4,000 allied health and nursing students, right? Like we're, like we're massive, but more importantly, what we're contributing to the state, right? You know, um, you know, 2,500 IT um, students, right? 1,400 manufacturing students on an annual basis. We're the largest provider of manufacturing straight, uh, training in the state of Connecticut. That's a big deal. Often it's lost all right, in translation or in the narrative when they describe us because they're only focused on credit, not non-credit and, and, and the litany of subpopulations and special populations of students that we serve. So it's been, you know, it's been extremely helpful and eye-opening you know, to our legislators, you know, 25% have taken all of their courses entirely online and then it's split across in person and hybrid, right? Just, just again, and 65% of our students have taken at least one online course, right? So just speaking to the breadth, right? But also the variety and the options that we provide our students. Um, I, you know, I mentioned 181 participating high schools that we partner with in terms of providing dual enrollment, right? So like our footprint is massive and we serve all of the urban areas and rural areas in the great state of Connecticut. And this needs to be a part of our narrative moving forward to better educate uh, the state on who we serve. So more to come, I'll share that with the Senate and then we'll work on placing that on our website. Uh, I also had student forums uh, where I met after each legislative breakfast, I had student forums, met with our students across these campuses and I met a litany of neurodiverse students, like a, like a lot of them they were speaking to, what is the level of training <laughs> that we receive to better serve them, right? Like beautiful and spot on questions. Student insecurity kept on coming up in terms of students that are sleeping in their cars, right? And what resources and things that we have for them, right? So we're working on some stuff and I look forward in partnership with the Senate to kind of figure out some strategies moving forward. Every student I spoke to was asking about athletics. Why don't we have athletics, right? And that, that's an animal that we need to, need to talk about down the road, not this, not this semester. Uh, met a whole bunch of DACA students. They're talking about their statuses and what we're doing for them. And then the SGA students and veteran students, they want more of a statewide forum and summit a group with, where they can collectively bring their issues to the table so we have a better understanding of what's going on. Um, a year from now, spring of 25, we have our comprehensive statewide NETCHI site visit. It will be the most complicated site visit in the history of NETCHI, and NETCHI still doesn't know what the hell they're going to do. Right, so they're they're trying to figure it out. We need to start that work. Uh, Dr. Jus uh, Dr. Jukowski, Provost Brown, Dr. Rook, Dr. Matheson will be the the, the co leads of our work group. We want to work in partnership with the College Senate to identify stakeholders across all of our locations because we need a statewide work group to do this work. Right, it is tedious. 
right? But we want to be transparent. We want to be inclusive in terms of what we have to do to get prepared for our site visit. We're going to have co-leads for each of the nine standards of accreditation, right? So uh, more to come, uh, Professor Vandermark, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you um, um, offline at some point to figure out how we can discuss this at the next Senate meeting. Uh, enrollment management, people have been asking about enrollment constantly. Um, we partnered with Forelli. Forelli did a gap analysis, spoke to a whole bunch of stakeholders, students, faculty, staff, GPAs, administrators, campus deans. So they'll be providing a report to us, to the college in terms of what they discovered, our gaps or challenges or opportunities. Um, we are seeking a 5% enrollment goal for next year. So we need to talk about that. And then lastly, uh, two items uh, that were questions from the College Senate and from Professor Vandermark. Um, we, are, we are in the process of finalizing the organizational chart. It is a beast of a project, but we are close. We will show, people will have their hands on that, I guarantee, prior to the end of the semester. But it's been a very tedious and difficult process. And shout out to Teresa Robbins, our, our admin here in New Britain, who's been working on that. And then last but not least, there were questions about Barnes & Noble. I just I would I would advise you just to watch the recording. Um, CT State's not involved in the Barnes and Noble um, proposal at this time. It's Charter Oak and the four CSUs. Um, so the only thing I will say is it was a uh, a lively conversation yesterday um, uh, among the among the regions among the visitors during the public comment, and uh, they've tabled it right. So we will we will learn more in terms of the. Um, uh, of the status and progress with the Barnes and Noble proposal um, for our four year um, uh, sister institutions. So those are my updates. Uh, happy to answer any questions any of you might have for me. Thank you. President Maduka, let me start by asking a clarifying question. If the board adopts this student fee, it would not apply to CT State? I believe I just heard you say it applies to Charter Oak and the CSUs. Yeah, CT yeah, State is carve out. Yeah, we're carved out because right now we're still under contract with Follett. And I know we have our own opinions about Follett. So, and we're new, we're nine months old. So it just, the timing wasn't right for us to even be engaged in the level of discussions and work that have taken place up to this point. So we weren't, we're not factored into what was uh, proposed yesterday at the BOR meeting. Okay, very good. Thank you for that clarification. Yep. Any other questions for President Maduco? Seeing no hands. Thank you, President Maduco. Moving on, uh, Chancellor Terrence Chang requested to join us, and we offered Bonnie. Your your microphone is on. Thank you. And we uh, agreed and offered an invitation for his participation today. So, Chancellor Chang, thank you for coming, and you have the floor. Thank you so much, Elle, and thanks to the group for having me in the space. And so I'll start uh, also by offering my condolences to the Three Rivers community and the CT State community over um, the really tragic passing of Alicia Ziegler. And I made the public remarks yesterday during the board meeting um, as well. But, you know, obviously this is very painful and sobering and anything that uh, my office can do, the system office can do to be in support. Uh, we're certainly there with you. So um, it's just, you know, there are no words. Um, I want to, I'll give you a quick legislative update. Um, you know, as you know, we're out there slugging away, trying to get funding for the system. And the ask right now with the legislature is $47.6 million. The majority of that would be to cover uh, the, uh, the, the budget, the remaining budget deficit uh, at CT State, which is about 40 million. And then the, the remainder of that would be for Western Connecticut State, which also finds itself in some, uh, you know, difficult financial times. Um, as I've said publicly and privately, this is not the be all and end all of investment levels. This is simply to balance the budget for FY25. We've been very clear that um, with the with with the reopener that funds needed to give folks raises would not be a part of that ask, and that ultimately this is not the major investment that our institutions and our system need. And so we continue to uh, work again, uh, mostly behind closed doors with our legislators and leadership to try to gain traction in that space. Um, and I do want to thank 
uh, L and, and this entire body, you know, first and foremost, as L mentioned, for the work, right? The work in and of itself to stand up a new institution, to be engaged, to put in the countless hours that you all are putting in, uh, just to do this, to, to make things happen across your campuses uh, and across the institution, um, but then also specifically for engaging with state leadership, with our elected officials, and, and in this particular case with the governor. Again, you know, I don't think there can be too many uh, voices that ultimately are out there advocating for what we as a system, as institutions, and as campuses ultimately need. So again, thank you for all that work. Thank you for that advocacy. And thank you for just the kind of the thought and the clarity and the, the poignancy of the message that you all are, are carrying on, on, on everyone's behalf. So um, I'll stop there because I know uh, Elle runs a tight ship. She told me I had 10 minutes and I saw that there's a little timer on this meeting, which is the first thing time I've ever seen something like that. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'll stop and, and just answer any questions that anyone has about, about anything. Thank you, Chancellor Chang. Uh, we, we did receive some questions, but I see Mark's hand. So we're going to go to the floor 1st, Mark. Thank you for joining us today. Chancellor Chang. Uh, working with legislators is always challenging. A large part of it is relationship building. I was wondering uh, with whom. You have established good working relationships and with whom you'd like to have a better working relationship and maybe also provide their job titles for those of us who don't know. Thank you. Who would I like to have a better working relationship with in the legislature? Is that what we're talking about? And, and state leaders? Or the governor's office. Uh, or all of, all of them, everyone. Right, I mean, as you just said, every, everything is, is so, all these relationships are so important. And so, you know, you can never have a strong enough relationship. Right? And, and I would never take that for granted. And I think, you know, look, let's be very honest last year. Um, I still wear where the, the effects of last year's legislative session very heavily on my shoulders. Right? That I feel that was definitely not where we wanted to land. And, um, you know, it taught me a lot. And so I've been really, really pushing uh, to, to rebuild certain relationships, right? In areas where I felt like we took a step back, but I'll just tell you that we've been consistently engaged with the heads of the appropriations committee. We've been consistently engaged with the heads of the higher ed committee. Uh, we're going in front of uh, the bonding subcommittee, right? With our capital ask for FY25. Um, you know, we talk to the governor's office all the time. We've been talking to OPM all the time. And so uh, I would say whether it's on the House side or on the uh, Senate side, we've really been uh, working very, very hard to make sure we have consistent, clear, transparent communications with all of our leaders, but also with rank and file legislators as well. When we can get a meeting, we take that meeting and we make sure we're just telling the story, right? And that's not you know, it's our story as a system, of course, but it's your story. It's your story as uh, campus uh, leaders and the folks who do the real work every day. And, you know, I don't know how many of you are, we're connected on LinkedIn, but I, I hope you see that whether it's my personal LinkedIn or as a system, you know, we're constantly trying to put the work of the faculty and the staff and the students out there so that we are showing um, just how productive and how positive and impactful that work is. And, and getting that across to legislators is something that we have not perfected yet. And I think that's a big part of the relationship building as well. I don't want to go up to a legislator and have a, a talk with them and have them say, well, gosh, I didn't know that. Right. And we hear that all the time, as President Maduko uh, said, and that means that we have work to do. We have a lot of work to do. And so uh, that's a big part of my job and we'll just keep doing that. But thank you for the question, Mark. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, point of clarification, uh, Chancellor, you you referred to the bonding commission. Is it actually meeting? Is it do we expect it to meet? Oh, so sorry, sorry. Um, so the bonding commission was canceled. I'm talking about the bonding subcommittee of the finance committee of the legislature. Did I get that right, Carrie Kelly? Because I know you know this better than I do. 
You have it spot on. So it's the bonding subcommittee of the finance revenue and bonding. Uh, it is right. meeting, but the governor convenes the bond commission, which is right. a separate executive and legislative body that uh, allocates right. the uh, bond authorizations. Right. So the bonding met. commission has not met recently, but we are going in front of that bonding subcommittee of the finance committee on Tuesday. Okay. Thank you for that. Sure. Sure. Angelo. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Chancellor Chang. First time I ever talked to you, uh, so that's a, a very uh, honor uh, in in seeing you here and, and, and being able to directly uh, talk to you. Uh, did you say we can ask you questions about anything? Um, sure. Do you mean that? I sure do. I mean, I'll okay. answer it if I can answer it. If I can't, I'll just tell you I can't. I don't know. We'll see. So okay, we'll this see. is coming from the trenches. Yeah. Okay. So from, this is coming from our people. Okay. okay. So yesterday at Middlesex, we had uh, the academic assembly mm -hmm. and um, there was uh, a big concern mm -hmm. about how smaller institutions are being voted out important committees. Mm -hmm. And it seems like Middlesex particularly is being targeted. Mm. Uh, so we had, uh, as you can imagine, lively discussion mm -hmm. and i'd like to know if you or maybe president maduco or somebody else is aware of a ranking maybe list of the important colleges in our system or not and if you know anything about this so i'll, I'll start i mean i i suspect president maduco might have some some thoughts on this as well so um listen i i mean we represent a very large system uh, and CT state is the largest part of that system. But, you know, we know nothing about uh, some, some activity like this, some kind of nefarious intent that would, would look to push out or lock out. If anything, we're trying to, I think we're trying to be as inclusive as possible and have as much representation um, and, and frankly, uh, equity in the representation so that folks don't feel that way. But, um, President Maduka, I don't know if you want to just chime in real quick on that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll you know, I'll speak, I'll speak on on behalf of my office, and therefore that means on behalf of the CEOs and VPs, there is no list. Um, and if there are allegations of a list or any campuses feeling like they're being singled out, I would expect that that's being brought to my attention immediately, um, and and give me the opportunity to look into that. Right. So, and we are not colleges; we are one institution that has multiple campuses. Right, and every campus supports all students statewide. So we need all of our locations to really fulfill our mission. So I, I welcome the opportunity to learn more and then give me and my staff the opportunity to look into it. Angelo, if there is anything that I can do uh, to help that effort, please don't hesitate to reach out. So despite the timer being up, I do have, uh, Alan's hand was up before the timer. I'll definitely go there. Nick, if there's time, I'll go there, but I don't want to go too far over. So, Alan, you have the floor. Thank you, and thanks for coming to uh, meet with us, uh, Chancellor Chang. Um, so, you said the majority of the budget deficit is uh, $40 million. The ask is forty-seven, and uh, or close to that, and uh, $40 million is CT State, $7 million is Western. Um, the the finances of CT State and the CSU writ large are intertwined, and I'm wondering why the 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 brunt of that is falling on CT State and is not shared more equally uh, across all the institutions of C CSU. Thank you. So, Alan, I'll, I, I, I'll try to answer the question as I've interpreted it, but if I haven't interpreted it properly, please just, you know, you can correct me. Um, but so I think part of the look, long story short, CT states budgeting now goes through a kind of central model, right? They are a system within a system. And so when we work, the system office works with the CT state leadership. Um, we are looking at the the macro of CT State, all of the all of the needs, all of the line items, all of the budget items um, across the entire 
uh, 12 campuses and the, the new Britain office and so on. And so I think when we combine all of that, that is ultimately where it leads us to approximately $40 million. And I know uh, Carrie Kelly probably has the more explicit uh, figures. Um, and so, you know, does that mean that it is? And, and I, I also want to just say that the system office is also working hard to reduce its budget as well. Right, we're trying to reduce uh, the lines that do not need to be filled. We are trying to, um, you know, be thoughtful and mindful about, um, you know, frankly, what can we take off of the books or how can we restructure and so on? Because as President Maduco's office has done, we also want to try to take on an appropriate level of the, the fiscal burden. The last thing I'll say is I think that there. Uh, continues to be a lot of work happening between my office and President Maduco's office about how do we ultimately get to a better place when it comes to shared services and what value CT State is getting from that. Is that model working as well as it can? What can we do to make it better? How can we continue to just be better and also be responsible and mindful of, of the, the financial circumstances? So I know that's a lot of words. I'm not so sure is this quite as fulfilling as I had hoped it might be for you, Alan, but uh, I hope that's a little bit helpful. And Alan, I I, yes. I hope I think that as we hear more about shared services from Lori Lamb, we will be able to ask some more probing questions. So, um, you know, kind of continue to think about this. Um, Peter, I had overlooked your hand and I apologize. So I am going to go before. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, Peter Bennett. And then uh, the last question today for Chancellor Chang will be from Nicola. Uh, good afternoon, Chancellor Chang. It's it's great to see you, and I appreciate you uh, joining the Senate today. Um, I just had a quick question, and, and I tried to do some online research, and if this is an obvious answer, I apologize. But um, I know we talk about the size of CT State now and, and how we're, how many students we're serving and so forth. I didn't know if there's if we have a foundation. My understanding is all 12 schools have a foundation, but when I think of a UConn with their $600 million endowment, which includes their foundation, they certainly are able to fund millions of dollars in operating expenses every year and that type of thing. And I just didn't know uh, if there is a foundation at CT State, what the plans are kind of on the fundraising side moving forward, because it's wonderful to be capturing all the stories in social media, which I think is great because clearly, you know, we've been a diamond in the rough for a long time. And I'm really happy that we're starting to educate people on how much lifting we're doing of people's lives. But yep. that could be followed up, obviously, by financial support and commitment moving forward. It might alleviate some of the financial stress moving forward. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point, Peter. Thank you. And and so I, I I'll let President Maduco speak about um, the CT State Foundation. I'll tell you that uh, CSCU, the system, actually does have a foundation, but its holdings are incredibly small. And I want to say 95% of it is earmarked actually for 1 scholarship, right? And so uh, there's really no CSCU foundation to speak of. And I'll just say that president Maduco and I have had an intensive amount of conversation about foundation work and so on. So let, let me pass that over to president Maduco, but, you know, he and I clearly, this is uh, something that that is very important to us and, and we try to do the best we can. So, uh, John, you want to speak to that a little bit? You're, oh, on mute, you're on mute, sir. You're not on mute. You're on mute from our end. Yeah, we can't hear you, John. You're, you're still on mute from our end. Try it. So while you while you are trying to resolve your microphone issue, I'm going to go ahead and go to Nick. Hopefully, yep. we can come back yep. to you, President Maduco. Okay. Yeah. Chancellor Chang, thank you. You know, for being here this afternoon with us. Um, my question for you is what. What are your goals for the CSCU system, right? Like, yeah. what are you, what's yeah. a 2 year goal for you? What's a 5 sure. year goal for you? What would you, what do you hope to see for us as a system? And then also independently Connecticut state. Yeah, I mean, so as a system, I just, I, I can, I came into this job, you know, in July, it'll be 3 years. I know time flies when you're having fun. Right? And. I continue to believe that we have not maximized our synergy and our potential as a system, right? We don't have 
the level of transfer from community college students into four year institutions that at the level that we should, right? We don't have the level of online uh, presence and offerings that I think has the kind of real massive potential for impact uh, in so many different ways. We don't have the level of kind of K-12 interconnection. Now, what I'm saying is that I'm not saying we don't have it at all. Of course, we have these things, but when we talk about an amalgam of institutions and campuses, and frankly, the superpowers of all of our folks at all of our places doing the things that we do best, that is an incredible level of potential that I would hope we would strive for. You know, and so what I would hope is that we will continue to just try to get as many students in as possible, whether that's K-12, adult, credit, non-credit, out of state, international, you know, you name it, right? We need to be serving as many people as possible. We need to evolve our educational offerings and curriculum so that we're serving them the way they need to be served, right? And I think uh, CT State and all of its campuses are primed to be ever evolving and more nimble and more in, in, in ever greater need and service. So we're not looking at 18 year olds all the time now. We're looking at people in their 30s, their 40s, their 50s. We're giving them credentials. We're giving them the degrees and the launching pads, right? And then I think we have to just do a better job of aligning what we do and just really it's a game of connect the dots right or plumbing whatever it is you a metaphor you want to use it's about connecting what we do and that power and that impact in a really tangible way because then that leads to the investment case and value proposition that is so crystal clear to our legislators and to the governor and everyone else that when we say this is the impact that we have and these are the statistics that show it. And that should that does not denigrate anything that's happening right now. If anything, I hope that it lifts it up now. Um, and, and frankly, I think it would start to alleviate some of the questions that are being asked, like, well, how come you're not more like post university? I mean, my God, where do we start? Right? Where do we even start? We have to do a better job of educating by really putting forward that great investment case. But I'll tell you, Nick, I think the challenge is that we're so we're at the start of a new beginning, right? Whether it's CT State or as a system, we are still at the start of a new beginning. And anything big, ambitious, bold, and new is hard. It's challenging. It's painful. Uh, we're going to go through moments that are very um, precarious. It would feel like, but you know, I'm still even with some of the lumps we take on a day to day basis. I'm still hopeful. I really mean it. I'm still hopeful, and I, I still think that. When we get this right, um, it's going to be amazing, and we are going to have a level of of power and impact that will be unmatched, not just in Connecticut, but maybe in this entire region. When you look at the the size and and and, and the force, so um, if, I'm if, still very optimistic. If I could ask a follow up on that, really quickly, I'm sorry. Um, are there strategies or plans in place in how to maximize that synergy that you speak to? Right. If, yeah. Are there, you know, committees sure. or groups with the relevant stakeholders from the campuses yes. working on this yet? So, so I'll, I'll be very, you know, uh, frank with all of you, um, you know, this, 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 the last few years, uh, since I came into this role and, and, and serving this, this system, it's been quite a journey, right? Trying to, trying to, uh, get, get folks to. Um, communicate better, right? For me to learn how to do things better. Um, we've had a lot of staffing changes. We've had a lot of organizational changes. We've brought in many new leaders as well. And so I am, I'm nothing if not honest. I'm constantly learning and I'm constantly looking at the things that uh, maybe didn't go the way that I had hoped they might go. And how do we do that better? You know, and I'll just use this Barnes and Noble. Um, you know, uh, uh, work that we were trying to get across the board uh, yesterday, right? And I said it yesterday in, in the meeting, and I'll say it again today. I think the leaders across our system did exactly what they were supposed to do. They did 
really good work. They did the right work for the right reasons, and they did it the right way according to our processes. And it didn't get through the board, right? And there are a multitude of reasons, as I, I think, as to why that happened. But that, to me, is less uh, of about a defeat as it is about a learning moment and trying to understand and say, well, what can we control and what can we do better? Right? And I think that is just an example of an approach where I feel like if five institutions come together and they say that this is a good thing, a good thing for our students, you know, and then ultimately it still doesn't get past the board. Well, it tells me that there are still levels of discomfort or we didn't educate enough or we didn't communicate enough or maybe there are blockages or maybe there are still, um, frankly, uh, components of our culture that maybe don't want the system to succeed in this kind of work, right? But it doesn't mean we're going to stop, right? And so the, the approach has to be consistent and we have to just do a better job of educating and partnering and learning and just trying to, you know, again, just try to do things that we think are good for our students. So I just think every moment's a, a moment is a learning example. I, I know I said we were going to move on, but Chancellor Chang, I, 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 I'm, I'm uncomfortable with something you just said. Okay. You referenced the issue yesterday at Barnes and Noble and said that if some institutions didn't see this as valuable, then we didn't do our work. That, but couldn't it be that the board is headed in the wrong direction? Couldn't it be also be true that an initiative that has such uh, resistance and articulate, grounded, researched opposition? might not be the right decision for CSCU? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I, I mean, listen, I, I stand by the work of the folks that I know who are doing the work, right? And so I, I, I now I'm not saying there's, there are no absolutes here, right? Obviously, you know, is it possible the board made a, a, the wrong decision? That's not, that's not for me to judge, right? I mean, the board made a decision and, and we're going to work with it. And, you know, again, it, it is a learning moment for all of us where we have to say, okay, if there's this much opposition to it, you know, and, and I want to be, again, very, very frank in my opinion on this, where did that opposition come from? What, you know, how was it, how, how and why was it mounted? Um, and, and what are the details behind it? You know, we have to take that seriously and we will, you know, and ultimately the things that, that should move forward will move forward. Right, because either we agree that it's a good thing and the right thing to do for our students, or we won't. Right, and for whatever the reasons that there may be behind that. And so, you know, we're just going to try to do good work, and sometimes we're gonna we're gonna uh, get together on it, and it's gonna hit, and sometimes it's not. And so, you know, we just have to keep pushing and and trying to do better. That's all. Okay, Seth, I hate to call on you because I know that this is going to be a long one. Do you promise to keep it short? <laughs> promise to keep it short. Um, and 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 um, thank you, Al, and thank you, Chancellor Chang. I guess I would just want to share also about the comment you made, Chancellor Chang, about the strong resistance to the um, the proposal with the book with the uh, Barnes and Noble. Mm -hmm. um, that I think I, I would also follow Al's concern that perhaps the wrong lesson was taken from the the um, that the the meeting yesterday, and that the um, CSU presidents actually failed. To work with their campuses to move this along in, a, in an effective way. So I think the process clearly did break down when you have such vociferous opposition from faculty, staff, and students, and it shows that the stakeholders were not engaged throughout the process that they should be. So I think I, I would just hope that would be the lesson. And obviously, this was on the heels of the no confidence vote um, of you by Eastern, you know, mm -hmm. which, which had very similar critiques of, frankly, your leadership and um, and how the system office has been has been um, proceeding. So I would just hope that more different lessons would be taken from these board meetings and it's good, it was a good action by the board to halt, you know, taking that action um, so we can start kind of having these, these, these um, continuous fights all the time. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, again, this is all part of the journey, right? And, and so, you know, re regarding what happened on the campuses, you know, the system, the system office is, again, sorry to, if, if our, everyone already knows this, right? We only took part in this because multiple institutions were already looking to work with Barnes and Noble on a program like this anyway. 
And so we said, hey, is this an example where we could get everyone together and use our collective kind of mass and volume and, and maybe use that as part of our leverage in a negotiation that would benefit the institutions? And the five of the six institutions, right, were ready to do that, and that's what we did. And long story short, I think the, the leadership group that worked on the RFP and the selection, I think they did a great job. They really did a great job. I mean, I just look at the, at the terms um, of, that, of that agreement. I thought it was a very good agreement. Now, ultimately, you know, there are still greater complications and, and so on and so forth. And what happened at the campus level? Um, you know, I can't speak to that because I am not the leader of these specific campuses or these specific institutions. And I, again, it is something that we will certainly learn from, you know, and I'll tell you that, you know, because, uh, you know, Seth mentioned this, right? The, the vote of no confidence at, at Eastern, you know, listen, I, I don't, I don't agree with, with many of the details in that vote of no confidence, but I'll tell you that ultimately uh, it is a message to me. And it is incumbent upon me to listen and try to understand and to learn, right? And so I could go point by point through it and try to be, you know, defensive about it. You know, that's not helpful. That's not helpful. It's not productive. It doesn't move us forward, right? What it did inspire me to do is make sure that I am reaching out directly to senates at institutions, that I am doing more outreach, that I am communicating, because when we and I, as the chancellor, depend on intermediaries to carry our message. Uh, maybe that's not so successful sometimes, right? So I say it all the time. I, I might be dumb, but I ain't stupid. So I'm not going to continue to make that same mistake over and over again. So if that means I get to meet with you all whenever you invite me, I'm happy to do that. I'd rather have that, you know, I mean, I trust President Maduko, but, you know, if we have to reinforce that certain things are going to be said directly between, um, you know, the chancellor's office and, and Senate bodies and so on and so forth, then I'm more than happy to do that. So, you know, it's definitely all part of the journey. Um, I think, I think, uh, uh, I know it sounds cheesy. I'm blessed to be in this role. I think we are blessed to work for institutions like these and ultimately the work is good. We got good people. I'm trying to stay positive because I really still think we have our, our best days are, are ahead of us folks. I really believe that. And so let's just, you know, I want us to stay together and try to work together to really help our students. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Chang. And in the, in the notion of the best days are ahead of us and perhaps a, a recommendation mm -hmm. as you have leadership committees, I, I heard you refer to it in a couple of different ways, a, uh, a work group, a committee, and then a leadership group. As you have those groups working on initiatives, mm -hmm. it would be great to have those groups present to the various shared governance groups for their input. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. We just, we, we don't tell our story well internally or externally. Right, we got to tell our story better and and I, I want to end on a positive note. If you didn't know this, uh, President Maduco was was invited to to present CT state in front of the board yesterday and he did a, a, a magnificent job and board members were blown away by the presentation. But of course, the presentation doesn't matter unless the content is, you know, dead on. And, you know, President Maduka represents you all so well with the legislators, so well with the public, um, and, and he did so well with the board yesterday. And, and then in our multiple conversations afterward, people were really excited and just grateful uh, for the work that, that is happening. But again, he represents the work that you all are doing. And so uh, you should feel really good about that. You should feel really good that the board really heard and saw what it is that is going on at CT State and how and how impactful it is. So uh, again, there's always there's always stuff that's negative that we could lock in on. Um, I just I just think that we there's so much more positive and and President Maduco really brought brought the good stuff home yesterday for for all of you. Well, thank you for that. And despite claims that I run a tight ship, we are now 21 minutes, 11 seconds over on this. It's issue. my fault. Al, you know what? I get blamed for everything anyway. It's my fault. It's all good. Don't worry about it. 
Oh, I am perfectly willing and able to accept responsibility for this one. Thank you all. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, President Maduco, there was a question where you were uh, unable to respond to the to the idea about a CT state foundation. I believe that was it. Do you have access to your microphone yet? I'm back. Um, Senator Bennett, that was a good question. So we have 12 separate foundations associated uh, with the respective 12 legacy campuses or 12 main campuses. And, and from day one, I made a commitment that I, I am not a proponent to merge those uh, foundations because that would be added to the list of civil wars that we have, right? Uh, and and uh, I'm not stupid, right? Um, so I'm not, I'm not doing that. It's uh, And I've only worked at institutions that have always had multiple foundations to mix money or to take money from one region to another. It never works, right? So it's not worth it. But we have 12 great foundations that do great work. However, you know, um, the idea of doing something statewide um, is something I've thought about, right? Uh, another a 13th foundation, I'm not sure about that. I, I, think that's, I think that's overkill, but an opportunity where I can leverage our statewide footprint and my office and our advocacy uh, to, to, to raise um, financial capacity to support things to scale statewide, I think it's important. I think the challenge that all of us are gonna face is that we have one institution, we have one catalog, one set of policies, one mission. If we do something to the betterment of a student at one location, right, as an offering, as a service, we have a responsibility through an equity lens to make that same thing available across the board. Easier said than done, right? Easier said than done, but like that's the burden we carry and we have to, fig we have to figure that out, right? So we're working on engaging with our 12 foundations, not to lend their money or anything, but kind of figure out a way, how do we do that statewide? And to your point, we have to do a better job in terms of a, a, a second lane of financial uh, advancement uh, to, to secure funding to um, offset what we're not getting, what we should be getting, but what we're not getting um, 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 from the state and other avenues. So, so that's a good question and more to come in that vein. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. As we move on to system-wide reports, I am really hoping that Dr. Chason Cardenas can help us get back on, on step. You said it was a quick one. I gave you 10 minutes. Anything you can do to help us get back on track, I would appreciate. Oh, you are also on mute, sir. Absolutely. I'll make this very fast and I'm putting some of the critical information actually in the chat so you can peruse it. Uh, let me start with the Gina Garcia, as most of you, and thank you very much for becoming part of the planning. Uh, our day was supposed to be April 8th. However, uh, that's not going to work due to some uh, responsibilities that have been thrust on CT State by, by the governor's office. And, and um, um, it's not the governor's office. It's one of the, the, the state organizations. Um, and so we have to respond to that. So. Uh, I am working with Gina Garcia right now to see if she can present either on the 6th or the 13th of May. As soon as I hear, we have the contract ready to go and everything else. Uh, and so we will get back to you and get this, this, this particular initiative on the way. Uh, I apologize for the delay. It was unavoidable, and, uh, but we'll get it back on the way. This is important and fun. Uh, now moving over to, uh, and I'll respond to questions at the end that way uh, we, on any one of these subjects. Uh, we are getting to the point of getting ready to launch these, the, uh, uh, what we're calling the climate survey. The climate survey will go out to students, faculty, and staff. Uh, while we keep on calling it a climate survey, it's actually three different services, uh, surveys. One is for students, one is for staff, one is for faculty. I want to use strong transparency in this effort. And so that's part of the reason I would request it for this time in the meeting. And I also provided in your chat the actual links to the survey and all the materials that kind of undergird it. We went with a national vendor who's named and normed this. They're actually the top, uh, they're considered the best uh, group in the nation for doing this work. So we're very happy to work with them. We've also outlined 
a, a, a schedule for releases of different information so we can try to up uh, the the uh, number of responses. Uh, so I, today I want to address just specifically the faculty and staff serving and to specifically request two things. One is an ask and a question, and you don't have to answer today, but I want to put it on your radar so you can be thinking about it. It's a dialogue that's happening not only here at CT State, but also across, uh, I mean, here in the main office, but also with the CEOs. And I wanted your feedback for it. The second one is, of course, the uh, a request if you would support us to get the word out. I am deeply concerned that especially our adjunct faculty and our staff that do not use email regularly uh, may have a difficult time finding and utilizing the survey. So uh, in many ways, you all uh, as the Senate are more trusted uh, than we are to get the voice to those adjuncts and so forth and so on. And so my request is that at some point, and I've actually put a date in there for you, uh, this is very much a change if you want to, April 10th specifically, uh, if you would consider writing uh, uh, some type of communication from the Senate to help uh, faculty and staff uh, understand that this is uh, something that we're doing as an institution and it will lead to a more positive effort. I want to finish off with, the, I already stated my, my stance on transparency, and so any questions that you have, I will answer today. I also wanted to assure you that this survey is confidential. I don't use the word anonymous because it really isn't. However, we've put a firewall between your responses and uh, the, uh, the ability to see what those responses are by CT State. Uh, because we wanted to uh, be able to have as much anonymity as possible. In the contract, we actually put a clause where um, the the vendor will actually review and follow up with each one of you who have not completed the survey several times. Uh, however, in order not to get that information, IP numbers and so forth, they will never give us that information. They will retain it and destroy it. And so the connecting block between the survey and who completed the survey is completely severed before it comes back to us. Um, and the last thing I want to say is the survey, by the way, is not the climate intervention. It is just the beginning or the data to start dealing with some of these issues of climate. The interventions will actually be uh, starting in the summer of this year and go through the end of fall next year, which is once we have the data of where are our problem areas. Different groups, one of them led by uh, Senator Bonnie, uh, who, who is actually the chair of our EI campus committees, uh, will be looking at that and other stakeholders. Um, and so my question in that is, how would, would the Senate would like to engage with that process uh, of looking at the data and trying to bring things forward that are helpful for faculty and staff when it comes to creating a climate where we all can feel like we belong. Thank you. That's really all I have. And then I'll answer any questions you have. Thank you. Can you explain a little bit about what the purpose of a climate survey is and what it seeks to do? Absolutely. The climate survey is looking at the overall climate, uh, how people feel. And it's really the, the idea behind the survey itself is, do people feel the, the core question that we're trying to answer? Do people, faculty, staff, and students feel like they belong in this institution? And it's trying to identify anything in that area uh, that would make our students, faculty, and staff feel like they don't belong. And that's really at the core of it. Uh, you can go in and look at the questions and you look at we do ask some questions around civil rights uh, issues. For example, uh, we ask about retaliation, right? Has retaliation occurred in CT State? We ask some of the other things too. And there's some open-ended questions for people to uh, be able to give feedback also. Great, thank you. Uh, Sarah? Just to clarify, um, so when we're drafting out stuff for our campuses, would you like us to share this link in particular, or will the a, the vendor send it out and then we kind of do that follow up communication? 
It is really the follow up communication that I'm asking you because in order to both prevent stacking, which simply means that one person is filling out 12 different surveys, right? Or the contrary, where we don't know who is filling out the survey, therefore we cannot follow up with them, you know? Uh, the company has the emails of people, so they that that the, the there is a token in the email that connects who responded to it. As a matter of fact, uh, folks like Bonnie, who are the campus person, uh, will be able to see uh, live who not who, but how many people from what particular areas have answered. Does that make sense? So they can make particular pushes and so forth and make particular asks. However, we will not have the ability to get that that those tokens and other information to connect the data. Thank you, uh, Roberta. Good afternoon, John Paul. Thanks for joining us today. Good to see you. It's um, wonderful to see you too. Thank you. <laughs> um, out of curiosity, and I, I know people that are watching from my own campus, I'm I'm certain they're wondering the same thing. Um, is this the same company that administered the climate survey for Gateway last year? And if so, is it the same exact questions or will it be the same exact questions? No, it is not. And they okay. competed for this. They, we had a, a, a committee from across the different colleges actually review an RFP and, and better. And, and quite honestly, this was a much better, better composed, better structured, better backed up. Uh, uh, survey than the other one. Uh, we did a few others besides the one in Gateway to be able to test some of these because sometimes they sound great on paper, but when you actually submit them and do them, they weren't great. I think that was our experience with the Gateway one, so we went in a different direction. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Any other questions? All right, very good. Well, Okay. 35 seconds remaining. Okay, what well, 35 seconds I still need uh, at some point if you the two questions that I asked. The first one uh, is I did how capture would you like to be involved. Yep, I captured your questions and we will provide a written response in a timely manner. Yeah. You are wonderful. You're so good. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, you all. Thank you. All right, moving on. So this is part announcement. Uh, Mike Stefanowitz is here also. I will call upon him, but uh, I am sharing with Senate. The information has previously been shared. I'm sure letting you know now that we will have a uh, elections this election season for a general education committee. Mike. You're not on my screen right now. I'm hoping you're here because you're deeply involved in those elections and I'm hoping you can weigh in and say a little bit more. Yep, I'm here at all. There we go. Um, I was eating a late lunch and didn't want to subject people to my, my noshing. Um, yes, uh, we, this morning, um, the Curriculum Congress finalized uh, their bylaws, um, including their membership, which included some changes. Um, so we, we know exactly the, uh, positions and Jason will be determining the terms for those positions. Uh, we, we have, um, gotten approval for the general education subcommittee of the curriculum Congress, um, including similar release time that the Congress has. Um, and also we'll speak later about the framework for the Senate. So what will we hope to do? time permitting is send out early next week a summary document um, announcing the cycle for elections for for this body for senate for congress and for the gen ed committee most of the senate elections occur by campus there's a few exceptions but you know 98 percent of it so you know uh, we can talk about that a little bit later but the congress elections um, are a mix again primarily by discipline. So those elections occur by school area. Also, there are elections for the school area uh, curriculum committees or SACs and the SDCs. Um, and then general education elections are by discipline as well. So we will be working with Jason Seabury, the chair of Curriculum Congress, and um, setting up those elections. And we will be helping facilitate those with our school area deans. 
But again, we are hoping to update our shared governance website with a complete and detailed summary of the positions we are electing, of the release time agreed upon with those positions, and the cycle and timeline. Our hope is early next week to have that out and then have a call for nominations open for 10 to 14 days and then have ballots available for voting for another 10 to 14 days. The final agreement uh, that the timeline, the reason why we're doing this in the month of April is if folks are elected and wish to propose this service as part of additional responsibilities, um, they need to make those proposals by the end of April to their campus deeds, and those need to be finalized by May 1st. So uh, April will be election season, and um, again, we'll, we'll have everything detailed out. I'll be happy to answer questions. I'll be working with both the President of Congress and the President of the Senate uh, to, to send out a detailed announcement. So stay tuned. And in the interest of transparency, folks, I am included on those emails. So I am seeing the the discussion between Jason and uh, and New Britain as as they are trying to figure things out. Uh, we have three folks asking questions. Alan, you're up first. Thanks, El. Uh, Mike, quick question. Well, two quick questions. Um, you said this is a subcommittee of Curriculum Congress, but it's not going to be uh, limited to members of Curriculum Congress. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, and what is going to be the makeup of the Gen Ed Committee? Is it by campus, by discipline? Can you explain that, please? Yeah, I just put a, I just put a link in the chat that, that you can click on. Um, this is, this is uh, has been posted on our um, shared governance website, actually, since the Congress approved a draft in December. So you can um, review uh, what has been approved of that makeup of the Gen Ed Committee. Um, and also I will put a link for the, um, the release time. Uh, the release time for service on Gen Ed will be the same as this year's release time for Congress members. So I'll put a link there to remind people. But again, we will summarize all of this in our general house. So Alan, that link should, should help clarify. Again, there is a struggle on the gen ed, much like on Congress, of trying to balance discipline representation, which is important for curriculum review, with campus representation. So I, I think we've struck a, um, I mean, they struck a compromise there. Yep. Thank you, Mike. All right, folks, I'm going to ask you to ask short questions. Mike, answer these as briefly as you can, yes. because apparently today's timer is killing me. Uh, Angelo, you are up, my friend. Uh, I don't actually have any more questions since Alan asked it for me, but I, I like to um, say I strongly support uh, to make sure that the makeup of these committees is a representative of all the uh, area of studies. We want to avoid a concentration of uh, members coming from the same area that might actually take over the agenda of the, these committees. Thank you, Angelo. Sarah, uh, Siglio, Sarah Siglio. Thank you. Um, for the election of chairs for these committees, because there can be a very big difference in release time between a chair and a committee member, um, is there any expectation when those elections will take place? Because for people submitting AR, it could be the difference between three AR hours and six AR hours. Um, it's anticipated from Congress that they will have a joint meeting in May with new members and old members and elect leadership for next year. So at that joint meeting, there may need to be a revision of ARs to that point, Sarah. Um, okay. For general education, it will be up to the members of that committee um, to meet and choose a chair. They could choose to do that in May before, before the summer. If that waited until September, then again, those ARs would have to be modified. Those folks would have to work with their local deeds um, for AR or release time. Okay, yeah, my concern was actually more the SDCs and SACs because that can also be significant. But I guess mm -hmm. what I'm hearing is everybody decides, and if they need to modify, they modify, and that's the plan. Realistically, that's may need be what has to happen. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah Perez. Okay, that was similar in the vein that I was thinking because if everybody. If you don't know if you're elected to curriculum or Senate, 
uh, to go on the subcommittee. Okay, so that's going to happen after. Thank you, Bonnie. My question is in regards to, do we have already approved compensation and roles and responsibilities that we are able to share? Because that's going to be a huge component already in discussions in regards to- Bonnie, are you talking about Gen Ed or I'm Senate? I'm talking about Senate, Congress, and Gen Ed, because they would so, all need to have all of that information for- So Senate, Senate is separate, and we will be talking, we are working on that more. It is an agenda item for old business. For Congress and Gen Ed, it is it is posted um, yeah. in one of the links. Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. Three minutes over. We've done worse, folks. Uh, moving on, I would like to introduce Lori Lamb. Uh, Lori, we haven't met before, so welcome to CT State Senate. We appreciate you coming and we look forward to hearing a little bit about the work that you've done. Great, thank you. And I am absolutely honored to be here with you today. Um, can you all hear me just to be sure? Yes, ma'am. All right. And then I am also going to try to share my screen. Okay. And let's hope this has more success than the last time I tried to do this. Uh, but we shall try to make this work as best as possible here. Trying to get that into presentation. Can you see that now? We cannot. Okay. Let's try again. If I hit share, that might help. There we go. There we go. Is that better? Now I'm going to try to put it into the presentation mode. Can you still see it? Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Um, well, I'm happy to be here today to talk to you a little bit about the work I did originally uh, with the CSCU and particularly CT State uh, with regard to assessing HR shared services. I did this originally as a consultant through Ask You Consulting, the American Association of Colleges and Universities. Uh, I was asked to come in and do some work to really look at what was going on in HR shared services and see if we could chart a future moving forward. I'm going to go through this today pretty quickly because you all have the detailed slides. So I'm going to summarize a few things as we move forward. Hopefully that might help you with a little bit of your time issue today. Okay, come on. There we go. There's the overview kind of, of what the whole presentation is, the scope of work, the process I used. I'm leaving out the process and some of that today just because it's in the detailed slides. Some of the big picture findings I found, some of the positive indicators, and some of the major issues and recommendations. I put back in this slide just a little bit ago because of your questions or your comments earlier on certain things. I will say the scope that I was asked to do was review the functions to assess the structure, practices, and processes, and evaluate how they were working to meet the needs of the colleges and the CSU system, CSCU system and then to, to identify opportunities for improvement, compare best industry practices, and recommend potential options and create a roadmap for those solutions. We also then looked at further at defining more of an optimal state for an organizational chart for HR across the entire system, including CT State and the state universities, including also labor relations compliance and, and all of those things to kind of say, how do we really support uh, folks doing human resources and labor relations work across the system. I also was asked to make some specific recommendations for looking at the search process since that had come up a number of times. What is absent from this is I was not asked ever to look at the financial implications of shared service or the costs involved. Indeed, no matter what information I sought and requested, and there's a detailed slide in there, I was not provided information. It didn't even appear to exist relative to what the costs before shared services were and any of the costs after. Obviously, I know information about costs to date in terms of, because I'm now in a different role and I'm here working within the institution. I now know um, all of the people that are in this function. I know what their salaries are. I know what the benefit costs are. I know what the non-salary costs are. I know those kind of things, although not off the top of my head. But I can tell you that when it comes to cost savings and things like that, it's impossible for me to determine because I was, when this whole business case for shared services was put together, at least to my knowledge and what was shared with me, there was never a, here's what the 
costs of this function are now, and here's what we project it to be in the future. That was, in my estimation, a big failing in part of this analysis, but it has not been provided to me. So I wanted to be clear, some of those questions I will not be able to answer because I have never seen that kind of information, nor was I asked to evaluate it. In terms of the big picture, again, there's more detail in all of my slides, but we really had to realize from the perspective of HR shared services that it was gonna require some transformative leadership from the chancellor and all of the executives. There was absolutely broad understanding amongst everybody I talked to for the need for change in HR shared services. Um, unfortunately, there had been a pretty significantly poor track record of implementing change or major changes well across the system. In fact, the track record was very little change management work was actually um, implemented in any way, shape, or form. But I also recommended that we need to look at those things into the future and also have everybody lead by example, treat people fairly, and pay attention to sound HR and labor relations practices along the way, which I didn't always find to be the case. There were, however, some positive indicators, and I think they're always worth noting. Whenever you're asked to come in as a consultant, you always tend to focus on the negative things. So I wanted to make sure we talked about a lot of the positive things, and those are the many dedicated executives, um, uh, President Maduko among them, certainly Chancellor Chang, others in the system office who are committed to the CSU and dealing with the multitude of challenges that they face, including those in shared services. There are, everybody is desirous of change. They, they wouldn't, hopefully they wouldn't have, um, initiated this review had they not been desirous of some, of some change and looking for a way forward to make things operate more effectively. There's also a willingness, as I see, and we talk about this regularly at the Chancellor's Office about how we have to mature the system into a better operating model that really includes all components from the system office to Charter Oak to CT State and the state universities. There needs to be a maturation process to make sure all the operations meet all of the evolution of the system. There are lots of dedicated system employees in, in HR shared services who work hard despite some very difficult circumstances to can you continue to improve processes and service. There's, there's a long way to go. We're gonna continue to make progress, but there are many people there with long tenures that are committed to continuing to maintain a career in the CSCU. And that was a very positive indicator for me. There's also a mindset from nearly everybody that I contacted in this review that we can always do better and that change and improvement are needed for the good of the system. So any, any unnecessary focus on what some of the problems are in the remaining part of this report should always be balanced with what are some of the positive indicators that were present throughout my review. So I'll turn now to the major issues and recommendations so we can get right to it. I identified at least two or three slides full of system issues that led to some of the issues. And I would say it was summarized as leadership changes that occurred, a series of mergers, many political factors, poor planning and poor change management principles all led to basically poor planning and implementation of HR shared services. In many respects, it was set up to fail. There were issues within the leadership of HR shared services. There again were many leadership changes. There was poor internal and external communication that I uncovered, failed relationships with key stakeholders, turnover and staffing, and unreliable HR and LR advice that was being given. And all of this had led to a lack of trust in HR shared services leadership. Within HR shared services, they didn't trust each other, and then consequently outwardly to all the people that they serve. Indeed, we have to talk about some of the cultural issues that were there. I, I uncovered a failure to see a system perspective, frankly, a lack of confidentiality on many issues that went past personnel matters. There was a lot of management by personality. There was extensive vitriol and unprofessionalism that I found towards HR shared services, HR shared services and around, and really an overall feeling of dissatisfaction across the system. I didn't do any scientific research, but Everywhere I went, I found a feeling of dissatis dissatisfaction across amongst faculty, staff, and more. And all of this has led to the inability to move forward as a team within HR shared services and a team across the system. 
So some of the major recommendations I made include one, we needed to develop a comprehensive communications plan. This is a fundamental part of good change management. And clearly my visit here today is part of that to make sure that people know exactly what were the findings of this report, but also what are some of the plans for moving forward? We are gonna create that system-wide organizational chart for human resources and labor relations, and we're in the process of doing so and implementing the same as we speak. We need to get agreement and buy-in from leadership about a new role for human resources and labor relations, which only happens through good communication and more. It was my significant recommendation that they needed to reformulate and and fix, if you will, the leadership position for human resources and labor relations and begin a national search for the assistant vice chancellor of HR and labor relations. I am interim in that role right now, but a national search will begin in a near future. I am here uh, primarily because I was asked to come start help implementing some of these recommendations, and one of them will be to conduct that national search in the very near future. We also need to complete create a comprehensive compliance unit that will house critical compliance functions. Um, and we need to do a national search for those positions. Frankly, I found a lot of times where searches weren't done at all, and that is not the way that HR or otherwise needs to operate its business. We have a lot of these compliance functions now, but they're all spread throughout different areas and they need to be consolidated for a more consistent compliance approach. Now, looking specifically within HR shared services, some issues and recommendations that I found. And again, there are some structural issues. Again, I mentioned some of the failed partnerships with key stakeholders. There were failed partnerships with EEO, unfortunately. That's a, that's a very sad thing in my world. Those two places need to work hand in glove with each other. Same with labor relations, same with bargaining units, et cetera. There's a failure in communication, a real silo mentality. Campuses and leaders felt unsupported and there's immensely complicated hiring processes and more, and all of this has led to poor relationships, lack of collaboration, and inefficiency, creating significant dysfunction. Again, there's more detail within the slide deck that was attached with your agenda, but I'm trying to summarize in the spirit of time. With regard to HR shared services and some of these structural issues, I made some Consistent recommendations with some of the overall leadership challenges, but reformulating the leadership position to the role that I currently hold on an interim basis. Um, trust me, I wasn't looking for a job. I had a job. I finished my job, uh, but now I'm here and I'm glad to be here and try to help implement some of this. I think we need to eliminate the name HR shared services and really rename it to human resources and labor relations because that's what it is. I'm not still sure what it means to be a, a shared service or not a shared service but we need to sort through that, figure out, and frankly, return some things to campuses, keep some things central, and work through that process. As I mentioned, we need to create a comprehensive compliance function. We need really to support CT State in hiring its inaugural Vice President of Human Resources, and I've been working with CT State leadership to help bring that to bear. CT State deserves and needs, and it will be actually very instrumental and helpful for the system to have a really good human resource leader in the system office there to help them as they try to move forward, both internally and work across the system. And then, as I said, we need to implement a revised organizational chart for how human resources and labor relations functions. We need to relocate appropriate functions back to CT State and even to Charter Oak and relocate and adjust, adjust the functions in the compliance unit, as I've mentioned. There are some specific unit issues that I made recommendations for uh, within HR shared services. Within that unit, when I first began my uh, study and when HR shared services started, it had the following units in it, EEO, which is now um, equity and civil rights under CT state, labor relations, operations, which is payroll and our data center, uh, talent acquisition, which is where we do the search process through classification, compensation, and benefits, and then HR strategy, which is really the, the framework for where the HR generalists and HR managers are housed. So with respect to each of those units in equal employment opportunity and with equity and civil rights, there has to be, in my mind, an EEO function within the system office uh, that cannot be completely uh, put out to the campuses there needs to be a correspondingly strong EEO and ECR 
function on the campuses to support all of you more directly, but directly, but there are board level policies, things like that, that need to be managed. There are facilitative roles and more that need to be handled at the system office. It should be housed in my mind within the newly created compliance functions so that all those compliance functions can work together cohesively. The second highest number of concerns I heard in this review process related to the search process and how long it was, and we need to work on that. And I've already in conversations and in good partnership, I think with John Paul to begin doing just that. And then again, we have to look at that. What is all the right role for everybody in the process? In terms of labor relations. Um, many of you may or may not know, but last fall, there were significant numbers of departures in labor relations that made this a really critical area of focus. I recommended then that we need to really reimagine and, and rebuild the, the position description for the system director of labor relations, who will be a chief negotiator, negotiator, strategist and manager of the team. And we need to, to do a national search for that position. We also need to reconfigure other staff persons in labor relations to improve the service delivery and provide increased levels of expertise and more proactive problem solving at all levels so that we can actually stop things from becoming larger problems wherever we can. That's not always possible, but hopefully we can do that wherever we can. Within operations, which is payroll and data, you know, we just simply have to get payroll functioning well. That was the highest number of complaints I heard, and understandably so. When I hear about the number of uh, people overpaid, underpaid, not paid, uh, it's a little bit shocking to me. And I'm not uh, entirely sure yet exactly all the reasons for that, but we're working very, very hard on those processes. We have to develop process flows and documentation. We have to have a better staffing model. We have to triage and response better. Right now, the email methodology that you can contact payroll th through is unacceptable in my mind. Um, we have to improve communication both into and out of payroll, develop training, move forward with the communication so that we can all communicate about what we all need in order to get people pay paid appropriately and accurately. We, I did recommend as part of my work last fall that we hire a specific payroll expert who really could do the deep dive. We did do that. Uh, that person is, is under contract and working hard with the team to not only assess, but begin some of the hard work in terms of process flows and documentation, et cetera, that we've been talking about. I also think ultimately my recommendation is to remove some of that, some of the easily handled day-to-day -day data and payroll work back to the campuses, hiring some HR assistants on the campuses who can not only be present, but could help people with some of the more routine matters that people need, whether it's a direct deposit change or updating their W-4 form or changing their address in the system or making a simple change to a form um, that doesn't have to go through all these email things, or there's even places where we have to send stuff through snail mail. and I frankly think some of this just has to end and we have to provide better service at the local levels in that regard. In terms of recruiting, as I mentioned, the search process was the second highest pain point. So we're gonna work on improving that process and do better training communication and tools for campuses on the process. I also think we need to really get clear about when we're not doing searches and why so we can live true to our equal employment opportunity and affirmative action and overall diversity and inclusion commitments. I also would move towards changing the focus from that recruiting action. They don't actually recruit right now. They just run a system that tracks the applications and moves them in and out of the process and hands them off to search committees as appropriate, et cetera. They're processors, they are not recruiters. I think they should become more strategic at recruiting and helping us expand our outreach and become more active sourcers of good candidates and helping other folks participating in the process and beyond to uh, become more active sourcers of candidates so that we're doing much more than just posting a position and hoping that a lot of good people apply. Compensation, classification, and benefits, is, a, is they're all critical functions that the system office performs. I, I think benefits and retirement should be moved into the operations and data areas so that all of our transactional components can have processes and workflows and work together more smoothly. We've already made that change. Uh, compensation and classification will stay the same. And ultimately, 
be um, expanded in terms of its horizon to be more of a service functional area that looks at everything from comp and class to onboarding to uh, professional development to uh, employee and faculty evaluation through how do we really help people navigate through successfully through their entire career at the uh, within the system, whether it's at CT State or any of our other institutions. HR strategy, as I said before, is really the HR managers and HR generalists who are on the campuses and they are their primary campus-based liaisons. There were multiple concerns raised that the model was not really working to serve everybody effectively. Um, so my proposal has been to move the managers and generalists back to the campuses and not be housed within shared services so that they can provide more cohesive on the ground HR services. And we will be, once we get a VP of HR on board in CT State, we will develop the staffing models, transition plans, coverage areas, et cetera, looking at telework as, as how it impacts and, and affects our ability to provide services direct to individuals on the campuses in a comprehensive training plan for those individuals. So in conclusion, I really, I mean, this was very complex. It was a lot of people to talk to, a lot of stuff to review. There were a lot of moving pieces. However, some key things I thought were really worth noting, and this is a summary of what some of those were. I really believed and recommended that the most critical factor to address was leadership for HR and labor relations through the creation of the position I now am in an interim basis, and also through um, improving and, and hiring a skill set in labor relations that can be more impactful. We need appropriate system level support functions around HR that are critical to HR and labor relations overall success, such as compliance, including equal employment opportunity, um, equity and civil rights is what it's called now in CT State, a robust uh, direct service delivery HR model at CT State and at Charter Oak. And these things will really help HR and labor relations overall work more effectively across the system. More, most importantly, I concluded that human resources and labor relations needs to become an advocate, more of an active advocate rather just than a reactionary transactional unit, but a more active advocate and supporter of both management and employees across the system. They need to train, empower, and support management. There's little to none of this occurring now. And they need to increase our focus on overall employee success from, as I said earlier, from classification compensation through recruiting, employee relations, performance evaluation, professional development, even into retirement. So those are my primary conclusions. And uh, I think I've run through that pretty quickly, but I'm happy to take any questions that you might have that I'm able to answer. With that, if it's okay, I will take my slide deck down so I can have a better opportunity to see all of you and if there are questions. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you sharing this ahead of time. It was a lot of information to process, despite us having three or four days with the information. It is. Um, did you, who did you talk to? I heard you uh, refer to CEOs. I heard you talk about, say that you had talked to a lot of people, but who exactly did you talk to to come up with this information? One of the slides in my uh, poll report ex has a whole list of all of the people that I that I spoke to in the process, but I spoke to all the system leaders at the system office. I spoke to CT State leadership, uh, President Maduco, Carrie Kelly, the CEOs. Um, I spoke to uh, a lot of the other leadership there. I spoke to John Paul. I spoke to um, folks in Charter Oak. I spoke to, spoke to state university individuals. I spoke to all the people in shared services and I spoke to um, all the bargaining unit leaders who were interested in having a conversation with me. Those were at least those. And I spoke to some people more than once. I spoke to some people multiple times, but that was that's sort of the summary of the group that I spoke with. Okay, thank you. I, I think I did see that slide, but I didn't see that there was any solicitation of a faculty or staff in that. Is that correct? I did that through the bargaining units, and that was um, what the direction from uh, the leadership was that they wanted me to do at that time. Okay, very good. 
Lori, I mean no disrespect to you, but I think this is an example of, of the search process and the lack thereof, because you have responded to every question that I've thrown your way, but isn't hiring you as an interim after conducting this um, investigation <laughs> study an example and a continuation of the problem that you identified? I would say yes and no. Um, I'm not a big fan of hiring interim, so to be one is there. I can tell you when I started this consultant thing, I had no interest. I, I've been essentially retired from doing this kind of work for, well, since 2016. There was no real interest in doing that. Um, I would say it would be a problem if there wasn't intent, wasn't a true and honest intent to uh, do a national search at an appropriate time in, in the future. Um, but there's something, two things happened because I wasn't looking for a job and I certainly wasn't making recommendations to build myself a job. Um, but two things happened. One is I became invested in all of you and, be, and two, it became clear, I think, to leadership that work needed to happen immediately. And that if you brought in another person, even through an, as, after a national search, that would take several months, more delay would occur. And that person would essentially have to start all over with the learning process that I had done over the last several months that I had worked as a consultant. So, um, it, so yes and no, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be coy about that. It's not ideal, but the, the spirit and the intent that we all entered into this was that we could begin to move forward more quickly with some of these recommendations, start making change and pave the way for a new person to come in uh, who can lead this organization going forward more effectively. Okay. Like I, said, I, I honestly wasn't looking for a job. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I don't, I'm not even full time in this role for personal reasons. I am in Arizona, which is also not ideal, but I'm very transparent about that. I come out to Connecticut as needed, but I care for my, my mother who's in memory care with Alzheimer's and and, you know, when they first inquired of me, I said, no, I can't do that. I can't be there. I couldn't work full time. And, you know, and they said, well, what if we can make it work? Because we really want to get started on some of this important work. So I'm being very transparent with you about that. Um, it's not ideal. It's not permanent. And uh, my goal is to try to make some of these initial changes so that we can set it up more strongly for the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know who's controlling the clock today, uh, John or Nick. Could you give us 15 more minutes for questions? And now I'm going to go to the floor. Um, Miguel. Yeah, um, thank you, Lori. And I'm glad that this discussion is taking 15 hours. Did you say, Al, we have 15 hours for this? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, on that note, Miguel, I'm actually wondering if the, if, if CSCU would be willing to entertain uh, Connecticut State's first Senate hearing, inviting the entire college to listen to an, a brief, to share this slide deck, share this slide deck, ask questions in advance, and ask senators to ask those questions. That's not to say we wouldn't provide some opportunity for questions from the floor, but I want senators to think about this and, and I would uh, be willing to make this argument to CT State and CSCU. I think that this issue is worthy of a Senate hearing, and I would like to hear more from you folks, from, from senators, after we talk uh, to Lori. But for now, Miguel, yeah. if you could be as expedient as possible, yeah. I would yeah. appreciate it. I'm going to try to do that. Um, Lori, first of all, I had to chuckle a little bit because without putting words in his mouth, uh, when Dr. Maduco started, one of the things we started hearing early on was there are two issues that I've heard, HR and org chart. And that was how he would start a lot of his speeches. And I, if I'm misquoting you, Dr. Maduco, please, please correct me. Um, but uh, I had to chat about that. Uh, just a couple of quick thoughts. First of all, um, I think one of the keys um, from somebody who's had a number of interactions, uh, both personally and through, because of the union with HR, uh, is that HR has to be open on every campus five days a week, period, end of discussion. Um, that, that's, that's, not, that's not a negotiable thing. Um, related to that, uh, payroll, there has to be a payroll presence on every campus. Again, that's not a negotiable to me in any way whatsoever. 
Um, Laura Ewell, I think, has 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 done a nice job trying to improve things there, and I've had a number of fruitful discussions with her. But there has to be a payroll presence on every campus. Uh, period. Um, again, in my opinion, um, I think there is a a, a a concern about. Um, I mean, you've expressed it. There's, there's, there's not, there, there isn't faith in HR. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think it's fair, and, and you know, and I'm, we're going to be frank here. We have frank discussions here. Negative confidence in HR, I think, is a fair way of, of expressing how a lot of people feel uh, towards HR. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that one of the things that needs to happen is not only a lot of the things that you've talked about, but even going as far as something like. Temporary oversight councils comprised of faculty, staff, management, and HR to, to talk, be able to talk about these discussions on a monthly basis, ongoing basis, uh, and things like that. Um, the, I will express one concern. I have two more points. One is, is a concern that, that you didn't really talk to faculty, rank and file faculty and staff. And I think that's really disappointing um, because those are the folks who are most often affected. And quite often don't know where to go or, or, or what to do. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is this, and, and, I, and I'm trying to phrase this as, as delicately as possible. I think that one of the issues that isn't articulated in your report um, is that part of the problem, in addition to what you talked about, was in some cases, not in all, but in some cases, competence. Mm -hmm. There were folks who couldn't do the job who were either over their head or just didn't have the tools um, and were allowed to remain and, 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 and that type of thing. So, you know, I'm not trying to get anybody fired. I'm not trying to do, but I think one of the things that has to be thought about is just the general competence level and making sure that as we try to move forward and improve this process, mm -hmm. that that general competence level, and I would say this is true in every area of the college, right? It's not just HR, to be fair, but we want to make sure that the folks who are in these jobs are, are capable of doing the job and ideally capable of doing the job well. So I thank you again for being here. Thank you, Miguel. Oh, do you, do you want me to on. respond or just do you want was that just for listening? I'm happy to try to respond as I'm able. Uh, if, if you can try to keep responses brief, sure. We've already got 6 more hands, so you're going to get some more questions. Um, so I will just say, as far as having, uh, HR open on campuses 5 days a week, I couldn't agree more. I and Carrie Kelly and I have been talking about that just recently in terms of some of the staffing models. And working there um, in the larger report, you will have seen there was a mention that we needed to address teleworking payrolls more challenging, but I under I hear you. I understand you. There's got to be greater access to payroll. Um, I will I will not respond to your comment about temporary oversight councils at this time, um, rank and style faculty and staff. You know, if I had thought I really didn't get a good flavor for what was going on, I probably would have insisted upon that, but I've had a pretty good flavor for some of the nightmarish things that were happening to our faculty and staff. And um, I, I, could, I could spend a lot of time listening to those things, but I was more interested in trying to find a path forward so we could fix it for the future. And that was just a decision that we made. And the competence level, well, it isn't a word I used in the slide. I think I was pretty darn clear that at a minimum, the leadership needed to change. And that was completely based upon competence to run the organization. So I hear you. I can't disagree with you on that. And I tried to address that. So thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Lori, can you say what you meant by address telework? Yeah, I, that we had to address it as an issue because it was impacting the ability to deliver services. And it still does to some extent. And as I said, Carrie Kelly and I have been talking about that, as have others within uh, the area. We have to get more people back on your campuses more days a week to provide service. There we go. I think that's the clarity I was looking for. Thank you. Uh, Nick. Lori, thank you for being at today's meeting. Um, I have a couple questions. I just 
please, for clarification, I just want to make sure that I read the report and from today's presentation, I have this correct. So your report advocates the hiring of an HR labor relations vice chancellor, a VP of HR, a director of compliance, a director of labor relations, an assistant VP of HR and labor relations and a compliance unit. Am I correct? No. No. Okay. Can you please clarify for me? There, there was an existing VP of HR strategy. Okay. My recommendation was to take that position and convert it and relabel it, rewrite the job description, if you will, into the assistant vice chancellor for HR and labor relations. There is no other VP of HR within the system office. It does recommend at the strong request and and consideration of conversations with Dr. Maduco and Carrie Kelly to have a VP of HR within CT State. That that is a new position. It does say to hire um, to do a national search for the vacant position of the Director of Labor Relations. It does it does say to have a new compliance director, which has recently been vacated by a woman whose name I'll forget. Her name is Michelle something or other. An existing position to characterize these positions, reformulate them, and and hire them with the right skill sets in these positions. Um, so I think you were one too many positions um, okay. that you were characterizing. And and to be very clear, other than the VP of HR at CT State, these are not new positions. These are reformulations of existing positions to make them more effective. Thank you very much for that clarification. And then a, a second question that I have. Um, prior to consolidation, each campus had HR, payroll, and et cetera, and we never had a problem, right? Or if we did have a problem, we were able to knock on a door and, and have a conversation with that person, or that person would actually come to our office and be like, oh, hey, something's wrong here. We need to fix this, right? Do we know what the costs are overall of what HR costs were on the campuses prior to consolidation compared to the costs that we are paying for HR shared, shared services and what that would be with the expected creation of these new positions that I'm sure would be pretty expensive to the system. I have never been provided information about what the costs were pre HR shared services. As I said early on, I do not know that I have not been provided that. I think it's a major failing in a effort of this size to not have done that kind of analysis up front, which is why I said there was poor planning and implementation of HR shared services to begin with. That's part of that. Um, so I cannot tell you that. Um, we can go back and rebuild models that say if we did this and did this and if it was like this, it's like that. But I, I have never been provided that information from what all existed there. What I do know is what exists at, at in within quote unquote HR shared services at this point in time. Um, I do know that um, we will have to make some strategic investments and over time as we do build efficiencies that uh, there will be savings realized uh, over some of those efficiencies. But I also uh, will say that um, to say there were no problems on the campuses when it all existed that way I, I've read audit findings that say there were tons of problems that existed that the state auditor would con continually find significant amounts of problems. And from yeah. what I was provided in the material leading up to the thinking of doing HR search services, part of it was to address those problems, which were one campus might do it this way and another campus would do it this way. And it would all be inconsistently done and often done not in accordance with either state laws or policy, et cetera. So, um, while an individual faculty or staff member may not have experienced a specific problem, there were problems trying to be addressed. I don't believe they addressed them in the in the exact right way, as I think is pretty clearly evidenced in my report. Um, but we will we will be working on probably more of a hybrid model where there are more people back on the campuses and some things left up in the system office, and that's the model that's proposed here. Do you think it would be more cost effective to just separate Connecticut State from CSCU for HR and just give Connecticut State its own HR unit? I can't address whether that's a cost effective thing. I also know that it's part of a system, much like we work with the state universities um, from a functional standpoint. I think we would lose, we would, we would 
lose the ability to leverage really good HR work across the system if we did that, but I'm, I can't address your question from a cost perspective. Thank you. Okay, so we have three folks left. I'm going to ask that uh, the question and responses are limited to two minutes. So, Sarah, if you could ask your question quickly, please. Sarah Perez. Thank you. Um, so, it's something that has come up on my campus, and it's not HR maybe specifically, but faculty approving other timesheets for colleagues. I just want to put that out there. That may be a discussion for another time. Um, but it does kind of impact and uh, translates to some of this. Um, I will say that I've been on searches before, and I just, this is more of a statement um, where we've had to do um, admin searches and using the Department of Administrative Services web, uh, their archaic system uh, doubled my commitment time twice on admin searches because it does not play nice with our system and the login issues. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, my biggest question is, would moving the HR managers and generalists back to the campuses then put that budget back for the campus? So I just wanted to know about funding, you know, if that was kind of talked through, would they still be paid through shared services? Um, because we're seeing that some positions are being moved back to the campuses, and I'm hearing that, well, then the campus would pick up that um, that, that piece for them. It was my intention and recommendation that if the HR managers and generalists move back to the campuses, the budget would go with them. That is my that is my recommendation. Whether that I don't make those decisions in the long run, but that is my recommendation. Lloyd, this is Lloyd. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. I, I I had been looking for you earlier. You didn't get questions because I didn't realize you were here. <laughs> go so ahead. We will. Yes. To the extent that personnel moves from the system office back to CT State, whether CT State in New Britain or one of the campuses, the budget will follow. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sarah, was that the end of your question? Thank you very much. Uh, Mark. Hi, Lori. A lot of goals. So, in your current capacity, what would be your top three goals that you hope to accomplish? That's a longer than 20 second thing, but the 1st thing would be to ensure that we have uh, the right highly the skilled people in the right places to do the good work. The 2nd would be to build the processes and streamline the processes to make sure we can do things as efficiently as possible. And the 3rd would be to return the appropriate types of work back to CT state and charter Oak that need to be there. That's as fast as I can do it. <laughs> That's okay. And you've got a couple more people coming your way. Uh, Sarah Siglio. Do we have permission to share? Our the slide set with our campuses. Absolutely. Great. Um, more of a comment. It would be appreciated if there was a clear way for staff and faculty and employees in general who have had, we'll say, incidents with HR to have a clear way to report those without fear of retaliation. Because when you have an issue with HR and you report it to HR. You really, it's really scary if you're an employee. Um, and you know, the, the there's the union, and the union's wonderful, but if the issue is HR, it puts you in a very different place compared to an issue being somewhere else. So having a way to do that that could develop trust, I think, would go a long way. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sarah. And Seth, you are our last. Person uh, again today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to share for transparency. I was one of the bargaining unit leaders that had the opportunity to speak with Lori, and um, and um, I actually did, did the best to articulate the concerns, and both in terms of our work with um, labor relations and more broadly the concerns we you know we've heard from members. Um, and and I will say, Lori, I, I want to thank you for for I think what the um, frankly accurate and, and honest. Overall report in terms of the many challenges that you know we've been facing, and I'll just make a really quick observation that, just for for the record, when CSU shared services was was frankly sold to us by the Board of Regents, 
they said it would, would one improve services and two save money. Um, with as as Lori has just shared, with absolutely no evidence that either would either would happen, and clearly it didn't improve services. Um, that that was the overwhelming consensus by you know our our colleagues across the state. And, the, and in terms of saving money, the, you know, that analysis was woefully um, never done either. So, you know, just a complete failure by our prior system managers. I wish Chancellor Chang was here to hear this and, and, and account for this. And there's been absolutely no accountability by and large for the system managers that led that led this debacle. So I we, it's certainly appreciated that our system has taken the efforts to, to remedy this, um, but um, just truly painful to see how we got here and all of the all of the faculty and staff, all of the workers um, who have suffered, frankly, um, from these you know broken and in many cases um, from these broken systems. But with that, there's an effort now to improve it. So you know that, that's kind of where we are. But um, so I just want to make that comment. Thank you, Seth. Lori, I know it was not easy to come before Senate. I do thank you. Um, I will be reaching out if the Senate deems it worthwhile to see if uh, CSU would be willing to hold a Senate hearing for the CT State College community. So please look for an email from me in following up. And I will just say, I do appreciate coming. It wasn't difficult for me at all. Um, you know, I wasn't here when all of this happened. I was trying to help bring a lens of outside expertise to the process. I want to say that it wasn't, it's not an easy set of things to tell people um, what is all wrong. But I, I also want to say that the leadership here has received what I have said, has not tried to sugarcoat it or hide it. And it is part of why I'm here stating what is some of the not very pretty truth about the situation. But I also want to say that I am very happy to be here working with leadership like John Maduco and Carrie Kelly to try to help make it better to the best of my ability. Great, thank you very much. All right, folks, what are we about? Uh, let's see, our plan break is well past its due. So let's go for a five minute break from 2.32 to 2.37. We will return at 2.37 and begin old business.
One of my favorite uses of the timer is for our breaks. <laughs> we rarely go over. <laughs> All right, folks, we are returning. We are going to old business. Uh, Sandra Vitali, have you joined us? Sandra. Okay, so I'm going to table the drop list report uh, to our next meeting. Just before this meeting, Sandra sent me an email and she had a family emergency she was tending to. So I am tabling uh, the drop list report. And moving on to the status of the Connecticut state resolution, um, I believe we have collected most of this information via email, but I would very quickly like to go through each of the campuses and ask that. And ask that the status of the resolution and if you haven't considered it, and it will be brought up again, please let us know that information also. You would think that I would have a list ready, um, but I can start with the easy one, and that's as Nuntuck. So as Nuntuck faculty has endorsed the board resolution or the BOR and CSU budget remediation resolution, Bonnie, what is the status for uh, staff council and then Thayer for college council? For staff council, they also um, voted for the resolution. Uh, for college council, we voted yes for the resolution. We endorsed it. Okay, thank you very much. I believe in alphabetical order. Are we next with Gateway? This is Roberta. Gateway endorsed it. Thank you. And does Gateway have just um, one shared governance body? We have uh, no. We have three, but the primary that would vote on this would be FSC, and they endorsed it. Very good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Who can help me? Who's up next? Uh, oh, here's my list. Uh, Who's the time? Oh, Capital, Seth, I missed you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Al. Um, so, no, Capital has not taken it up yet. Um, and I'll just say personally, I think in part due to uh, not lack of clarity on whether we collectively understand this resolution as a, as a no confidence resolution or or not because frankly we, we've kind of heard this be described in different ways at different times and in some cases by campuses that have passed it um and i think that's a lack of clarity that hasn't been helpful for our our campus frankly in terms of how we understand this resolution and, and, the, and the intent of it Okay, well, maybe we can get to that once we do the survey stuff. It was my understanding that this was not a vote of no confidence. It was a predecessor. This was more to encourage discussion at the campuses to see if that was warranted and it would be a next step. But having laid that framework, maybe we, we uh, circle back to this once all of the campuses have been um, surveyed. Husatonic, you passed this at your campus, is that correct? I believe you were the first campus to act. That's correct, Al. Thank you. Uh, Manchester. Hi, this is Jen. Uh, we endorsed our academic senate, endorsed it. Uh, that's our main governing body, so we did not put it out in uh, the CCP meeting. Okay. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, Middlesex. Uh, we discussed it in both governing bodies or student, uh, excuse me, our staff council, uh, student services assembly. There we go. And our fact, our academic assembly, uh, there were no votes on it. Uh, didn't get to that point. Uh, there was similar to Seth's report out at Capitol. There was some ambiguity questions, um, wondering kind of what the goal or purpose of, well, not necessarily the purpose, but more so the goal, what were we trying to achieve? Um, so it has not gone to vote. Uh, and Thank then you. on the staff, that was more so on the faculty side and the staff side, um, was very quiet when I introduced it, didn't get much discussion. So it seemed there that there was more indifference. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Naugatuck Valley. 
So we sent a survey out to gather feedback because our governance structure is so new. I would like to bring this back up at our Senate meeting for the month of April, but I did get um, the majority vote at this time is in support of the resolution, but I also got feedback between more clarification discussion around what this means. Perfect, very good, thank you. Uh, Northwestern. Um, we took it to a pro Senate, there was conversation about it. Um, a motion was made to adopt, but that motion did not get seconded. So, dining committee. Very good. Thank you. Norwalk. Yeah, you know, we uh, had very limited discussion, um, no resolution, um, no real uh, in depth discussion. Uh, so, um, we are uh, involved in a variety of other things at the moment. <laughs> And um, we'll see if we can take it up in April. Okay, thank you. Quinnebog Valley? Uh, I'd give the same response that uh, Senator Astor just gave in terms of had some limited discussion and there'll be more discussion in April too, so. Thank you. Three Rivers. Three Rivers voted to endorse. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Tunxis. Tunxis endorsed. Okay, very good. Thank you, folks. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Perhaps the, the question that remains is what are we trying to achieve? And uh, Felicia, Crystal, can, can each or both of you weigh in a little bit um, on the resolution and what we thought we were trying to achieve, because I do think that this might have changed quite a bit since it was originally uh, taken up and perhaps as a body, we choose to do something different at this point. Do either of you want to weigh in? I'm kind of calling you out with this because we didn't anticipate this question, but if either of you can weigh in, that would be helpful. Thank you, Elle. I, I see that it has changed and I apologize. I'm partially back from maternity leave and playing catch up. I'm not sure what discussions happened prior to today's meeting, but it does seem as if it's going in a different direction than what it was originally intended. I, if memory serves me correctly, when we first brought this up, we wanted all 12 campuses to be on the same page and to bring this issue to everyone. So that way we can be in solidarity. And it seems as if people are or campuses are taking more from this than what I originally expected. I don't know. Crystal feels the same. Um, but I don't want to just speak for Housatonic. I know Geneva and Assange were also here. So if, sure. I, I'm open for discussion. I guess this is where I'm at with it. I do want the original idea to still be at the forefront, but if we want to add additional things to this, where do we see this going? I, I can't speak for anyone else, but I think it's still important that we don't lose sight of what the original purpose was. Okay. Crystal, do you want to weigh in or did Felicia summarize that uh, the current situation? She, she summarized it perfectly. I was just going to essentially reiterate exactly what she just said. The sentiment at the Northwestern campus actually was they felt there was too much in the resolution um, and there were parts that they agreed with. There were parts that they were unsure about and that it was hard for them to collectively um, a vote for or against um, with so many different components that were mentioned in the resolution. So that's why it kind of died on our campus because they didn't want to vote one way or another with there was too many things. So. Folks, um, here's the recommendation I'm going to make, given where we are now. It looks like actually eight campuses did endorse, and that's significant. Mark, I see your hand. Go ahead before I continue, sir. Yeah, we saw it, the resolution as a nice middle ground. It wasn't a vote of no confidence, but it was pretty harshly written and a strong signal to Chancellor Cheng and uh, the executive leadership with uh, the dissatisfaction that's out there. So we thought that it was a strongly worded statement 
but that there is an opportunity to learn from it and to take positive action as a result of it. Thank you. So perhaps we can do some work uh, via email between the next two meetings. And with eight campuses having voted to endorse, if we work collectively, uh, perhaps we can come up with something that is that the Senate could endorse at our next meeting. Felicia, I see your hand. I just wanted to ask a question um, based on Mark's comment. You said that it seemed a little harsh, harshly worded. Is it because, and um, I apologize, this sounds harsh. Are people afraid to just say what they're thinking and be direct? Because I, I wanted, I think we all wanted us to be very clear that we're not happy with the budget and let's not play games and talk in circles. Let's be direct. Let's say that this will impact many of us in several different ways or some of our colleagues. And our um, our bosses, you know, do we do we want this to be very straightforward? Do we want to be straightforward and say, hey, we're not blaming you, but this is what will be the direct result if we move forward with this quietly. I just want to make sure I understand. So as we think about how we want to change it or if we're going to change it, I can understand because I personally am a very straightforward person. I like to hear yeses and nos. I can get the explanation later, but. I just want to know what the main point is here. Thank you, Felicia. So we have three folks who have, are, are now interested in participating. Alan, you're up. Thank you. Um, so I'm trying to just uh, nail down a couple of things in my in my memory here. I know that Gateway had brought an endorsement of the FAC resolution that was similar to this to the Senate. Did the Senate vote on that? Mm -hmm. The Senate voted to endorse that as well. Then it, I, I, and, and, I'm, I'm ninety-five percent confident, Alan, that Colina made the case that yes. endorsement was important for advocating with with uh, legislators. Yes, and I can check after this meeting and follow up. But I am very confident if Colina is on the call, perhaps uh, she would know the answer. You're correct. Are, I don't know if she's here, but yes, that's correct. I reviewed the minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank and you. then this resolution was drafted after that meeting and has not been voted on by Senate. Is that correct? Uh, it has just not that, been voted on by the Senate. That is correct. However, this, I believe, I believe this resolution was a result of several resolutions that were still in draft form, Alan. So I think yeah. that this resolution preceded the FAC resolution. No, Roberta is saying no. No, because some of the draft language came from that document. When it was in draft form. Yeah. It hadn't been, yes, when it was in draft form, it hadn't been uh, passed yet at FAC. Um, okay, I just wanted to spoke, be. I believe we spoke about clear. it here first. I believe Kalina presented it here first. And then um, in January we were, is when we came together and we started discussing this current resolution. But I, I think Elle's saying that that the, the Senate resolution was borrowing from a draft copy of the FAC resolution that, that was circulating that is, at the time. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. In addition to yeah. other resolutions that were circulating at the time. Okay. And. So, are, would you want to take a vote of the whole Senate on this, or are you waiting for un, un, unanimous approval on the campuses? If there is a motion made, we will act on it, but I would ask for any motion to wait until we hear from the, the next 3 people. Sure, uh, Jennifer. You are still on mute, my friend. I'm going to, I'm going to go to Peter and then I'll try to come back to you. Jennifer, Peter Astor. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this conversation brings up the problem we've had in Norwalk. We've had, uh, 5 resolutions that we are considering. And, um, you know, each one has their own strengths and, and merits, 
but uh, each one has their own group of, uh, of individuals who, who wants that particular um, resolution. And uh, we're finding it very difficult to come to uh, uh, some unanimity on, on which one we should uh, endorse. Um, I, I certainly uh, uh, have found merit in, in almost all of them. But again, we are a little confused about which thing we're voting on or, or which thing we're considering. And that's the issue we've had on campus as well. So um, if there was something really clear that everybody agreed that this is what we're voting on, um, next week we have a meeting and maybe I can push it. I'm, I'm not convinced, uh, but uh, okay. there are a lot of factions. What can I say? Factions, uh, the nature of politics, my friend. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, any luck over there yet? Yes, hi, thank you. Um, so I did say that Manchester did vote to approve. It was a fairly interesting discussion. The main thing is some of the feedback that um, Seth and the other campuses have said is that quite a few of our campus did have issues with the wording, but they did ag agree with the spirit. And that's why they decided to go forward with it. Um, because they did feel it was a little too, um, a little too direct. Uh, they, you know, they were concerned about in that manner. Um, so really they went for it for the spirit and just to kind of say, hey, this is these are our concerns. Um, the wording, the concerns overwhelmed the um, wording. So it's something to keep in mind. It wasn't, it but it wasn't revise. a general. It wasn't a big concern. I mean, it was only a couple of people who expressed concern. Okay. But in general, they just approved because, you know, again, they were, there was one comment that why, why isn't there any, like a comment or, or backdrop to the question and so forth. But even the claim of any kind of a research is, doesn't have to be in the resolution. It, it is a resolution. Right. Thank you, my dad. Thank you, yep. Jennifer. Uh, Seth, did you decide not to speak or do you just know I'm coming to you? You know, I'm coming to you. No, you're done. No, hand down. Okay. All right. Is there a motion? Hearing no motion, uh, I will return this back to, uh, Crystal and Felicia and I, and we will review what you folks have said. And we will try to do some work between now and the next meeting. Thank you all for your input. Hopefully this will help us move things along. Moving on to the CEO president discussion. Mark, the floor is yours. This can be fairly lighthearted, but the uh, college executive team's been putting out a lot of fires over the last several months. And I know that in the order of priorities, this matter may not rise to the top of the list. Nonetheless, it's one that stares us in the face as a decision from the early days that could be fixed and demonstrate a new beginning. As a professor of business administration, the title of campus chief executive officer doesn't sit well. It's too corporate. It's not a befitting title for a nonprofit college or university. And I think this could be easily modified and a great opportunity perhaps for a bottom-up participation. I would recommend maybe an anonymous poll coming from the college asking, do you believe the title of campus CEO should be changed, yes or no? If yes, what do you think the title should be? And then executive leadership could take a look at that and see if there might be a better title. So I just wanted to throw that out there for a little bit of a discussion to see if maybe I'm the only one who uh, gets annoyed by it. And uh, I cede the floor. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mark. When you say from CT State, do you mean New Britain or do you mean the Senate? I mean from New Britain. Thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, Angelo? Mark, I, I feel like you. Uh, it, it looks like weird, like a, a CEO. I don't know. It doesn't fit with the, the academic world. 
So I, I would uh, I agree with, with the, your point. Um, I also was wondering, so rather than asking people like, you know, freely, what do you think it should be? You know, and then who knows, right? What we're going to get from everybody. Maybe you want to suggest like, you know, a couple, like five of them to choose from like, rather than asking openly, hey, what should it be? And so just to kind of streamline the whole process, maybe. So rather than an open ended question, a multiple choice question, Angela. Yeah. Something okay. like that, yeah. Thank you. My uh, only so fear is that the five presented options might not be the right options. So I think, uh, <laughs> you know, let let leadership get all the possibilities, and then they can they can choose what would make sense from there. But um, so who will win? The one audience. with the most uh, the, the the title with most uh, people that will be the winner. Well, importantly, there wouldn't really be a, it, it would ultimately be a choice made by New Britain, right? Correct. So it would inform, it would inform a decision. That's right. Okay. Uh, Seth. Uh, thank you. Al. Um, just want to say, uh, I, I love the idea from Mark. Um, we've heard students complain about this title as well. Um, students say it makes no sense. Um, and, um. And, it's, and, you know, I mean, I just, from my personal opinion, is just further kind of evidence of the uh, gross corporatization of public higher education that's happening all over the country. So, um, and, and, you know, and we can point to so many other bad ideas from the, um, from the consolidation plan um, and, and, and um, some of which we've, we, we've, we've um, undone, thankfully. So I think this could be another one. I would just suggest that our Senate send it out as opposed to, um, our, um, our, um, as opposed to management and it have just be something that our center sends out to the, to the campuses. And then obviously we'll take the, the feedback and transparently share it, you know, and, and come to any recommendations as a body in the process as well. If we, if we choose to, so I'll, I'll make that suggestion. Be because the purpose of shared government governance is to make recommendations, Seth. So we, we could do that survey and then make a recommendation to leadership. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, where are we? Nicola and then President Maduka. You know, Mark, I 100% agree with you, but for full transparency, I'm at three rivers and we still have a president. We don't have a CEO. I think there's only one other. If someone, if I'm incorrect, somebody please correct me. Um, Western. President yeah. Brooke, you are correct. Okay. Um, I do like the idea of going back to presidents on the campuses, um, but I do think that we need to be cognizant of the fact that we have President Maduco. So would that warrant we would need to do a name, a title change there? Because remember how we had President Chang and then they had to do a title change there because they said that, you know, the, there was confusion because there were so many presidents. So would we then have to come up with a new title for President Maduco? I think President Maduco keeps the title of president. We would have to find a different name. President Maduco, perhaps you would like to weigh in, sir. Oh, we can't hear you again. <laughs> While you are fixing that, I'm going to go to Sarah Siglio. Yes. Sarah, oh, there Hello. you are in the nick of time. You can hear me? Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah, yeah, this this has been a riveting uh, conversation. Um, so, so, so a couple things. I I just want to make it clear: New New Britain isn't a decision maker when it comes to these titles because all vice presidents and all campus leaders report directly to me. So it wouldn't be a group of people up here because I wouldn't ask my VPs about what their opinions are about the titles of their colleagues, uh, out of respect to their colleagues who are the campus. Uh, leaders, um, I think, I think too, um, I'm, I am the spirit of what people's thoughts are on what titles should be. But then to me, my concern is that's a slippery slope. Then is it all titles are being assessed, you know, and then do the people in those roles have a, have a say in terms of their own titles in terms of, um, in terms of that piece, right? Because titles are associate when when those people are hired uh, in terms of uh dr Jukowski and dr rook it's it's more legacy right and that's something that i haven't 
uh, honestly, I haven't tackled yet because I feel like that's not a priority right now. I think the the fires and the infernos that is CT State have been more pressing. Uh, but I think at some point I will address that. I, I, I will address um, the titles. Um, I think too. You know, we're we're, we're still in flux. Uh, to be honest with you, in terms of also, I'll be honest, and I've, I've said this to the campus leaders and the vice president. I said, I, you know, to to for me to. For me to say that the current leadership structure of today is going to be the same leadership structure two years from now, I'm not going to commit to that, right? Like, like, like I'm not, right? I, th I think there's still some things. I think uh, Professor Freeman, I think other, I think many of you privately have told me. I think even campus leaders and vice presidents and others have told me in terms of there are still remnants of the legacy components of what the original, the quote unquote original design was, right? And there still needs to be an assessment of of, of what's appropriate and what's necessary. And uh, I wanna make sure I'm being thoughtful to that. But I do think, I, I would ask for all of you to take a step back and ask yourselves if that can be done for the campus leaders in terms of what the what, what do the masses feel their title should be? Then it's an open season on anyone with the title, right? And then if you are the employee in the role with the title, are you not waving your hand saying, well, wait a minute, it, it doesn't list in my job description that at any point my title, if people don't like it, give me up to the masses, right? So I just, I, I, I just think that I think we need to, I think there needs to be some grace too, in terms of the, uh, the campus leaders is CEO, a, a romantic title we want in academia. It, it's, it, it's, we all have our opinions about that title, but I want to be fair to the people. Uh, to the leaders and people and professionals in those roles, like that is that is my two cents. But ultimately, New Britain is just New Britain is just a location. New Britain houses bargain staff. New Britain ha handles some leaders, but New Britain isn't an entity, right? New Britain uh, consists of employees uh, that also ultimately report up to me. And I want to I want to make that clear. Ultimately, some of these decisions are are my purview, not not uh, the consensus of the people who happen to work up here in New Britain. I want to. Just, just like, just be clear, you know, all campus leaders report directly to me and they have equal station um, with, with the, uh, with the vice presidents that have their respective titles. So that, that's just my two cents. It's interesting. And I've, I, it was weird to me when I got hired in the interview too. So I'm not, I'm, I'm at full transparency, but we have to be mindful of the people in those roles. I, I take what you're saying, President Maduka, and let me take res some responsibility for referring to New Britain. I think that uh, the shared services report that we heard, uh, more importantly, the shared services slide deck that we read and the various naming problems from CSCU to CT State to system office um, and the various titles included in that mm -hmm. contribute to a tremendous amount of ambiguity mm -hmm. and on a regular basis, as a senator or a committee sends me a series of questions that I then need to chase down, it takes an inordinate amount of time and effort to sort through what level of administration does this go to? Does it go to an office? Do I send it to you? Do I send it to the provost? So oftentimes New Britain is Shorthand or CT state sometime is shorthand for just talking about administration or leadership in a colloquial way and not to group it all together. Uh, but before those recommendations are sent, a tremendous amount of thought and care goes into where they go. Yeah. Uh, Sarah and then Seth. Um, thank you, uh, President Maduco, um, for for your insights. And with respect, it does seem that there's something unique about the role of the campus CEO slash president, in that they're a figurehead for that campus in the community, as well as for the students, staff, and faculty. And that what their role is called has an impact on how that campus is viewed. And through that lens, how CT State is viewed. 
So, you know, if the, you know, everybody gets a survey and somebody's job title is up to the masses, isn't a great approach. And I can like, I can see that um, perhaps just hearing that there are concerns with the impression that title gives that it's overly corporate, it's impersonal, it's non academic, perhaps whoever makes that decision could reconsider to a different title that would be uh, more befitting and give a better impression of what that person's role is and the impression that we want to give to the public and our students and the employees. Thank you, Sarah. Seth, once again, you are the last person speaking on an issue. Thank you, Al. Um, so thank you, uh, President Duke, as well, for your um, feedback. And, and I, I think I would like a, our body to proceed and 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 obviously um I think the intent would be to ensure if if whatever recommendation we made about any changes, if we were to come to recommendations, you know, we would ensure we would move in a way that would provide an equally honorable title to individuals. It's just a title to be clear. We're not talking about compensation, but an equally honorable title that wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't want to impact individuals' resume that they're planning on their professional pathways. Um, but, but, you know, this, there, there are so many changes that faculty, staff and students had no say in, and this is 1 of them to be clear. So, this is just an opportunity to hear from the community um, and 1 way or another. So, with that said, I'd like to make a motion that that um, our Senate puts out a survey to the community um, and that I, I like Mark's original suggestion of yes or no and any suggestions keep it open ended. I don't think we need to spend the time finding 5 options that let's get what, see what we get from people and then see what that feedback looks like. So, so that's not the motion. Um, uh, Mark's original suggestion, yes or no, and then um, if you do think it should be changed, what options do you think would be appropriate? And we collect that information. Is there a second? I will second the motion. Mark seconds. Is there any fur further discussion? Yes. Um, with that said, I, I like, I noticed that, uh, Miguel put in the chat that combining Joe and Angelo's ideas could work. I do like that, um, that path, uh, to have some preset options and a fill in the blank option. Um, so I'm just validating what was put in the chat in case anybody did not see that. Folks, please remember that anything in the chat is not part of the record and I can't even keep track of it. So if, uh. If something is said in the chat, it needs to be articulated uh, by someone or it doesn't make it into e even the minutes. So thank you for that. Uh, Alan? This is a question. I don't know um, if there's an answer available, but um, if the title of vice president were chosen, would that it, you know, is there, is it, I don't know what compensation is between vice presidents who are serving CT state as a whole and those who are serving at, and those are serving as leaders of campus, but I'm just wondering if that would be an option or does that raise issues about compensation, things like that. Uh, if anyone knows the answer to that. Seth, yeah, are you answering that question? Oh, sorry, President Maduka. Yeah, I'll answer that. Not, not, not to try to cut Professor Riemann. Um, regardless of the title, uh, titles from managerial confidential, typically they're grouped by um, by certain levels, right? So you can have, um, you know, there are there are vice presidents presidents that are that are at different quote unquote levels. There are exec one vice presidents, exec three vice presidents, et cetera. And the same can be said for campus CEOs. I do think just, and and again, I've thought about this. I've thought about this even before I was, even before I was hired in terms of of that piece because it's just it, it is it's confusing in in so many ways. But my preference for me because ultimately I would have to make the decision is, you know, address a lot of upside upside down titles as it pertains to management. Uh, that I believe are uh, in some ways inconsistent or, or, or maybe not aligned with where we're headed. I think there still needs to be more analysis uh, that, that's done, right? Because trust me when I say this, when there is a title change, people feel a certain way. 
<laughs> even when it's coming from a good intention, because that that individual with the title is like, well, wait a minute, right? So there, there's again, you know, titles to me, this is a human resources matter, right? To change someone's title is a human resources matter, and all of us are employees, management and labor. And when changing a title, right, you throw everything out in the window. At the end of the day, that person who might have their title changed, they have a they have a say, right? They have a say in terms of like, why is this happening? Why is there a change? Do I not have any say? Yes, I feel that, you know, people might feel a certain way about my title, but I've gotten used to my title. There's a lot that comes into that, right? So again, I just think take a step back and reflect on uh, titles is attached to an individual, right? And there, there are some things that have to, you know, have to be assessed, but also taken into account in terms of the impact to the individual. So I just want to make sure that I'm fair because I have to, I have to apply that to all employees across CT stat. Just, I, I just think Senate, just ask yourselves if you go down this road, what does that mean? And, and again, when I was a faculty and staff, I was a curmudgeon. So I'm just, well, let's not stop there. Let's, let's, let's assess everyone's title, right? So just, just think about that right now because the CEOs in question are going to hear about this. They're probably hearing about this now. And they're like, okay, that's nice that our titles are being talked about, but we're not, we're not at the table. Are we going to receive the surveys? Does anyone want to know our opinions about this? I just think at the end, there are people involved. There are professionals involved, right? What we're called is a personal thing. So not, not putting down and dismissing anything that you're saying about the corporate piece, about whatever. But at the, en at the end of the day, the employment agreement that these employees signed had a title. And if that's going to be changed, and therefore the employment agreement has to be updated. And that employee is going to say, well, wait a minute. Will this change two years from now if people get dissatisfied with my title? So I just think we got to think about the individuals. When it comes to the employee, agree uh, employee agreement, it's not a group thing. It's between the employer and that employee in terms of the terms, but also what that person's referred to. So just let, let's just be mindful about that. And again, I wasn't there with, with the creation of the CEO title and a whole bunch of things. But at the end of the day, we have people in those roles with those titles. We got to think about them as well. Thank you, by the way, for Mark, answering you the have question. Asked a waiting <laughs> question here. Uh, Peter Bennett. Al, I'm just following up on your your note because I did put something in chat, so I'll just kind of read it. Okay, for the record, Thank I just you. I've struggled with the conversation because I'm unsure of whether this really falls within our charge to recommend changes in title. Um, I do think it has the potential to open many other doors to potential issues, and it sounds based on the conversation, nobody's really questioning the roles of the leader of the campus, whatever we call that person. Um, I'm just not sure it's the best use of our time as a Senate. And I just said, I, I respect all kind of, you know, the opinions here and the conversation, but I just want to put my two cents in. It just, it doesn't feel like, uh, th this is an issue we should be talking about. So not the best use of our time yeah. as we are 1 hour over yeah. our initially. Uh, our initial schedule. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Roberta. Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, Dr. Maduka, I appreciate your. Saying what you just said, I'm sorry, I'm all teary eyed. Um, titles do mean a lot to people and you don't really realize it until it's taken away without cause. There are people across the system who were demoted as a part of the consolidation and have not been made whole since. And it does impact them and it is personal. And um, I think that those individuals should always be at the table and consulted and given the opportunity to speak about what they do and um, how those title changes impact them. So thank you for bringing that up. I, while I hate the title CEO, um, I would not want to take away someone's title because um, I know how hurtful that is. Thanks. Mark. We are an advisory body. We're not giving or taking away anything. We're just having a discussion. And what I'm suggesting is purely just providing more information to President Maduko. And it's his call. And would the CEOs be consulted and asked? Absolutely. 
you know, what do you think about the title? How do you like it? Would you like it to be something different? So it's, it's purely an opportunity. I saw it as an opportunity for bottom-up participation. I already see in this discussion a desire to have it all figured out at the top before we even get to discuss it down below. Whereas I'm just saying, who knows what this title could be? I don't even have a suggestion. That's why it, it's so difficult that I thought we might open it up. I remember back in the day when they asked us, what should the title of the new college be? And I remember they asked on Friday and then they told us the answer on Monday. And I submitted a suggestion over the weekends, but it seemed like the decision had already been made. So I just thought this was an opportunity for participation and simply a survey and, you know, the names, they could come and President Maduco could look at all those names and maybe there'd be an epiphany and then have a discussion with the CEOs. What do you think about all this? But we don't have any influence on any of that. But I just did want to have the discussion that this is something that that just that title doesn't sit right with a lot of people. And it's not an, anyone else's titles. I think everybody else's titles seem to be just fine with everybody. So I don't see it becoming a slippery slope. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. Seeing no further hands, please, the, uh, the motion, a Senate survey to the college community asking if the title of CEO or president, uh, if the title of CEO should be changed, yes or no, and then recommendations. All those in support, please raise your hand. All those in support, please raise your hand. It looks like we have 10. 10. Thank you very much. Please lower your hands. All those opposed, please raise your hand. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yes, John. I think it's stable at 19. 19 opposed. Thank you. Go ahead and lower your hands. Any abstentions? Any abstentions? It looks like it's stable at four. At four. Okay. Uh, the motion fails. Despite the motion failing, Mark, I think that this was a very useful conversation. Agreed. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all, folks. All right. Moving on to the framework for release response. Uh, who will be taking up? Uh, Provost Brown or Mike Stefanowitz? Mike, thank you. Sure. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to share. Uh, the framework uh, that was proposed uh, March 6th, I believe, due to lots of work and discussion upon your Senate leadership. Thank you, Elle and Nick and John um, and Brian, I think, right? Um, that framework has been approved by President Maduco and Connecticut State Administration. Uh, will be over at 3.30. Oh, uh, Peter, you, Peter, can you go ahead and sign? Thank you, sir. Sorry, Mike. That's okay. Um, the, the proposal, I believe everyone has seen that proposal, right? Al? We can send out again the proposal, but it is um, the discussions began in the fall semester. So this proposal will be retroactive to September. Um, I have reached out to HR and payroll. And we will be uh, developing a plan at a meeting next week with Laura Ewell, and we will be developing a plan for capturing the work that folks have done um, above the release time that you've already been granted to match what meets the proposal. 
So I think that's very positive news. I think it's a great example of the impact of leadership and shared governance. Um, what was very helpful was a very detailed breakdown of how hours were being spent by um, leadership, by subcommittee chairs, by members, so forth and so on. And we went back and forth a little bit to try and place those hours within a semester framework. Uh, that was a little bit of a challenge, but we got there. So um, I'm happy to, to, to share that. Um, and that will be the framework in release time going forward uh, for elections when those are announced next week. Excellent. Thank you very much for that update. Mm -hmm. If I had the wherewithal to be doing those little uh, celebration emojis, I would, but I'm not an emoji person, so I'll leave it to other folks on the screen to do that for us. Uh, Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, President Maduco, for recognizing the incredible work that the Senate has engaged in. All right. Moving on to bylaws. Sarah, I am going to turn this over to you and give you the floor. Well, thank you everyone for last month. We had a very spirited discussion around terms. Um, so the bylaws committee sat down this past month. We've met a lot in the past month um, for hours at a time uh, to work on this. So we added the term language. We painstakingly went through each motion and each update to the motion to ensure we captured the appropriate language. So at this time, um, there were a few things that we weren't able to finish our um, to submit for amendments. And so I'd like to do that now. Um, I'd like to share my screen if that's okay with everyone. You you should be able to do that without any problem, Sarah. Okay. And shift. Okay. Oh, this feels weird. Okay, here we go. So the first, um, the first motion um, that I would like to put forward is to update the language under Part Three Terms, Section. Well, it should be Little Three, I think. Sorry, the this and um, so under more specifically under. We've approved this language terms shorter than 3 years do not count towards term limits. I'd like to make a motion to add to this as it pertains to the initial staggered terms. I'll second that motion. This is Alan. Hold on. Let's get the language of the motion. Correct. 1st, hold on. Can you read it 1 more time, Sarah? Yes. So, under terms, we are adding under the smaller section. As it pertains to initial staggered terms. As it pertains to initial staggered terms. So, uh, just as a refresher, Sarah, please help me if I don't have this quite right. But what this is doing is capturing in the bylaws, the motions, and the discussion from our previous meeting. Is that correct? Yes. So, when we were discussing three year terms, but with staggered terms for those initial faculty, staff and at large members. Very good. Thank you. There is a motion. Is there a second? Alan seconded. Alan seconded. Thank you. Sorry about that. Any further discussion? Just to clarify, um, since I made the original motion, I thought it was important to second this. This is just to distinguish between just to, to make absolutely clear that if someone's term, like someone leaves office and another person comes in to complete that term, that this is not that somehow then that, you know, once they're in a three year term, someone comes in and serves the last year of a term, this uh, caveat would not apply to that. It only applies to these initial terms. Thank you for that. All right, all those in favor, all those in favor, please raise your hands. All those in favor. 
can't find my button. Oh, very good. We will add you. You made the motion. You can't okay. vote against oh. it, Sarah. John, please add one. Can you close the window, please? I don't think she can, Angelo, oh. because we have more items coming from this. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, John, has the vote stabilized? It has, but just for clarity, we're adding, so we have 30, we have 30 hands up, but we're also including Sarah, so 31. 31, yes. Okay, thank you. Please lower your hands. Please lower your hands. Very good. Any opposed? Any opposed? No opposition. Any abstentions? Oh, Brian, are you voting against? Sorry, went to switch screens with the minutes, hit the wrong button. Oh, okay. Any abstentions? One abstention, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Sarah, is there another motion? Yes. The next motion, um, we, to under terms, we'd like to put a motion. We have more underneath as it relates to elections, um, but this is just for terms. Uh, the motion is student senators, uh, student senator terms shall be one academic year in length. This is Roberta, I second it. The motion under terms, student senator term shall be one academic year in length. The motion was made by Sarah and seconded by Roberta. Any discussion? Angelo. Uh, let's ask if there's going to be a description of the job for the students uh, so that they will know what they're required to do to be part of the Senate? We will be coming forth in April with more details on description. So I will capture that for the bylaws committee. Thank you. Thank you. In no further discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. John? Uh, currently at 31, counting Sarah. No, I'm sorry, 30. Counting Sarah is 30. Down, counting Sarah is 30, yes. Thank you very much. Well, I just changed. But oh. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it bounces around. Somebody, maybe somebody took their hand down because I spoke. So. Oh, okay. Go ahead and lower your hands. Still have their hands up. Two. Okay. Uh, all those opposed, please raise your hand. All those opposed, please raise your hand. No opposed. Any abstentions? Any abstentions? Two abstentions, John? Yep. We have two abstentions. Sarah, any additional motions? Al, Al I'm sorry, I have a quick, uh, just a quick point I wanted to bring up. In terms of the student senator, um, one thing for the uh, election or bylaws committee is to think about when they want to do the election for the student center based on the enrollment of the senator, based on the enrollment of the student. They may be enrolled in the spring, but not in the fall. So I just wanted to bring that up as a potential issue. I think that's coming right up. Uh, Sarah, is that the next motion? Uh, it's part no, of it. Quite. It's part of a longer, okay. a longer group of motions, but we will address that. 
I believe we have it in this. Yes, I have that in here. The next motion, Sarah. Okay. Um, so the next motion, I'm going to break this up into the highlighted sections that we are looking at. Um, so that way it's easier to capture. So the first motion is Senator elections. It's under nomination and elections to the Senate. Senate elections, all senators shall be elected following their respective home campus governance structure. Home campus governance leaders shall submit names, membership role, and contact information of newly elected senators to Senate Elections Committee via the email at EO College Senate no later than April 1st of each year to allow for transition of senators. You're doing just can you that put that text in the chat so that we can keep it for the minutes? That would be great. Okay, can one of my fellow like bylaws people do it? I can't see anything but you guys. <laughs> Brian, we I'll have this in we we have this on our um shared governance on on the SharePoint. On the SharePoint? Yes, sir. Okay. Is there a second? Could I could I suggest um adding section two, small Roman numeral two, because it clarifies that the April first date does not apply to this year. Okay, so I should amend it to include both one and two. I can do that. Um, that would be my suggestion. And Sarah, I think you can say that the motion is to adopt the language shared in the draft bylaws. And what you would do is say, um, I, I don't know where this is in the, is it four? Section four. And elections yep, to the Senate. Four. Yeah, yes. um, items are A, one and two. Okay, perfect, because we're not doing the other one. Okay, so I'd like to make a motion. So I'd like to amend my motion. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to make a motion to adopt the language in section four, nominations and elections to the Senate. Small letter A, little I, and uh, little one, and then little two. Good. Very good. A motion made by Sarah and seconded by Roberta. Is there any discussion? Peter. Peter. Um, with with the uh, stipulation that this year. Uh, that day would not apply. I think somebody had already mentioned that, but uh, yes, it is. It is part of the. It is part of the language. Okay. Yes, yes sir. Thank you, uh, Miguel. Yeah. Can I can I just hear the rationale for April first? That seems very early. I can do that. You want to take it, Roberta? Unless you'd like you'd like to, I've just given you a break. Go for it. Okay, so I'll just start and then my fellow bylaws committee members, please jump in. So our, so this, this year is crunched. If we move this to an April 1st, this allows people to put even their, if they choose to run, and we're going to get to that later, if they choose to run for executive office, this also allows enough time for AR to be updated in the future and release time to be worked out for that May meeting. So if we move these elections up in the future, um, and we won't be having such large elections in the future because we're gonna be having staggered terms, um, but it allows for in the future us to make uh, an easier transition and folks can join us and in preparation for that May meeting. Okay, that, that's fine, thanks. I'm actually going to remove this because we're not going to discuss this today. This so seeing no further hands, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. All those in favor, please raise your hands.
Sarah, are you in favor? Yes. Sorry. That's 29. 29. Thank you. Go ahead and lower your hands. Go ahead and lower your hands. Any opposed? Any opposed? Seeing no opposition, any abstentions? Any abstentions? I see one abstention. One abstention. All right, folks, we have gone over time. I need a motion to extend the meeting. Sarah, how much more time do you think you need? I just have to get through the newly elected members and I'd, I'd like to try to just do the elections committee and executive officer positions because this will impact us for as we discuss framework. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a motion to extend the meeting to 4 o'clock? Mr. Norberta, I move to extend the meeting to 4 p.m. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Second. Thank you, Murdad. Any objections? Any objections? There are four objections. The motion carries. Thank you, folks. Sarah, the floor is yours. Okay. Next motion. Um, newly elected full time sitting senators shall attend the main meeting prior to the start of their term to participate in Senate executive officer elections for the subsequent year. Is your motion to adopt that language? Yeah, sorry. It's a group effort, Sarah. So your motion is to adopt the language of little three of three I. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Is there a second? Roberta. Stephen, I'll second it. Perfect. Thank you, Stephen. A motion by Sarah, a second by Stephen. Any discussion? Miguel. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. My camera is being wonky. I, I don't know what's going on. Um, I. Oh, Miguel, we've lost you. Miguel. Uh, we may have lost him entirely. Can somebody please text Miguel to see if he dropped off the call? I am. Thank you. Sarah, is there a, can we uh, suspend? I don't even know if this is a thing, but we're going to try it. We're going to suspend this motion and move to the next yes. so that we can hear from uh, Miguel when he comes I'm back. I'm back if you can hear me. Oh, yes. yes, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, logging out and coming back in is sometimes easiest. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, I just have a, a concern about shall attend um, because we're commanding that people must attend. Um, and so I, I'm just a little, the, the, the phraseology is a little concern. I might suggest just a technical edit to say something along the lines of, um, you know, that the, the, those senators will, you know, can attend or should attend or something like that. But I'm concerned about shall in this specific context. I may be the only one, but it just, it jumped out at me. Because what happens if somebody can't attend? Well, you can always be absent from a meeting, Miguel. I guess I, I just, if nobody else is worried about it, that's fine. Well, okay, uh, it, it, John. It, oh, no. John. Yeah, I just wonder if anybody's put any thought into uh, what affects having an additional uh, twelve senators would be in this meeting, and if that would have an effect on, you know, I don't know, maybe quorum. Or, um, or, I don't know, length of meeting or other things that having, you know, moving from 36 to 50 senators would make for just the main meeting. We, we did talk about that, John, this is Roberta, um, because they, 
the new senators would just be participating in their election. Those of us that would be going off the Senate would not participate in that election. But that is, we're still the senator for the month of May, so we would be participating in all other business, and they would not. It'll, it'll be a little, you know, we'll have to juggle a bit, but we think we can do it. So does this need some sort of explanation as to the voting rights of the newly elected full-time sitting senators to not be able to vote for current Senate business? Or are we gonna presume that they are allowed to vote for it because they are elected or they're not technically elected, they're just participating in the election? How does that work? That's a good um, point. I, I'm not using the purple language for today's information. That's something the bylaws could go back and add for next meeting. I believe we have that under terms about when the term starts, but let me check on that, okay? I think that we would need clarifying language that basically said that the newly elected senators or the <clears throat> senator, the senators that will be serving on the following academic year are the only ones who are voting on the executive board for the following year. In that the newly elected, not currently serving senators are only voting for the elective, the um, executive board. Because my hand was up for the same reason that. John had. Sarah, why is the pink uh, lined out? Because this is language in the pink that was brought to my attention that I'd like to move for the April meeting because there's more uh, flushing out that the bylaws committee will need to discuss now that we have a staggered term. So some things have changed in our discussions. Um, and so I'd like to move that pink piece for April. I've, and in, in th so this pink, this pink section actually responds to the concerns that are being raised. Is that right? Yes, we would have to flush out additional language in terms of who would be voting in May. So the expectation is that these issues, the issues previously identified will be addressed in April. Okay, thank you. Um, Alan. Thanks, Al. I'm I'm going to suggest maybe we table this motion until the language is uh, we get drafted language that addresses all these concerns, and then that could be a um, a quick a quick vote in April. That's that's a suggestion. So we could table it, or Sarah, the you can withdraw the motion. Um, Bonnie, do you want to go and then I can. Mine is just a question if their, their, their new positions, the new senators coming in does not begin until July. Or, you know, as of the new year, they wouldn't have a vote. So why would we need more language to kind of solidify that? They're there as transition so that they can hear what is being kind of wrapped up for the session. So their term in all actuality does not begin. So why would we be concerned about more language? Sarah, do you want to address that? Um, I know, and you know what, right before Senate, some things came up. I, you know what, I think I'd prefer to table because this piece won't affect us until the May meeting. I'd like to um, take back this motion and we can work on the language for this, for little three. For little three. So, Sarah, you're withdrawing your motion. Stephen, do you concur? Yeah. Okay, the Bonnie, motion is to, withdrawn. Bonnie, to your point, I think what they're, they're just voting so that they're, they're voting for their executive board for the following year. They're, that's the only reason why they would be able to vote. So they just have a word in with who is going to be representing them at the executive level. So it's it's the secondary vote that's occurring, really, right? Like the executive body within that meeting. Because I, I was kind of confused in regards to, is it just for the executive? Because I thought they were just transitioning for the month of May so that we could have a good transition. It, I, I thought it was just for the executive is, board. 
Okay. Yes. Maybe is, it, is an overlap so that they can get a sense, but also I, Sarah, are you going for the executive um, council for I, this meeting? I was going to try. Okay. I'm going to let you have the floor and then that might bring some clarity to this conversation. Okay. I'm confused. Okay, so we will table this because I think to Miguel's point and to we didn't table it. I mean, just a, a point of clarification: we withdrew. That's you withdrew fine. the motion. So we yes, will come please. back in April with a stronger language to address some of the pieces that were discussed today. Um, I'd like to make a motion to accept the amended language for the elections committee. So at the start of the spring semester. The Senate shall appoint an elections committee among current senators not running for office. The elections committee shall conduct Senate officer elections for the subsequent year, shall facilitate communications regarding Senate officer elections uh, to Senate membership, nominees, campuses, and CT state leadership, shall facilitate communications regarding Senator elections to campuses. And I'll pause there. Okay. So there's a motion to adopt the amended language related to the election committee as reflected. Is that this right? Is Sarah? Alan, I second the movement. I second oh, the motion. Second. Can Alan. you scroll up so I can get the lettering correct? It's B, but what's above B? Can you scroll up? Yeah, it's nominations it, and elections. It's four, it's four B. Okay. Four B. So we have um, uh, the motion by Sarah. Uh, we have seconds by Roberta Allen and one other voice I heard in the ether. We're just going to go with that. Is there any further discussion? John. So do I understand uh, in plain reading of this, that this means that a uh, someone serving on an executive team that is considering to run again to serve an executive team wouldn't be allowed to participate in the elections committee? If you're planning on running for this next term. So the, so the, the officer would need to know in January, whether or not they were interested in running. For the next term, so they could be right. sure not to participate in elections committee. Yep. Wouldn't you just basically have them what, just was, off was that was that the intent? Was that the intent? I thought the intent was. Um, if someone is running for re-election as a senator, or or this is about serving on the executive committee, executive. what was the intent? This okay. is for, in terms of because they're facilitating the executive officer positions. So if they're also running for executive officer, but they're also collecting and communicating. But Sarah, couldn't they step away from elections committee in April? So that they are not participating in elections just for the executive council, this uh, executive officer elections. Let me go to Nicola on this. Can or someone from the bylaws committee? Yeah, I would say maybe we include language that basically that so executive board people who want, you know, if they decide to run, that they just do not participate. They have nothing to do with the executive board elections that other members of the election committee, you know, they just abstain from helping in collecting that data. I think that needs to be very clear. I don't think they should have anything to do with the elections committee. Yeah, but then what happens if somebody's sitting on that elections committee and then they decide, oh, you know, I, I want to run now for whatever reason. And so now <laughs> does that yeah, put them out of I'll, preclude them from running? They would have to step off the committee. I, I agree they would step the committee. Off, Roberta, but I I think that John has identified a complication because the election cycle really begins in earnest in January and folks might not know if they have a desire to run for executive council in January, but certainly they should withdraw from participation by a particular date.
So where do we stand on this one? Uh, Miguel, sorry about that, sir. It's okay. No, I'm going to echo that. I think it, what you want to do is you want to avoid the appearance of impropriety. So I think that that it should be um, I, either a, a firm date and or uh, a declaration of candidacy for an office. Mm. Either one of those would result in uh, the immediate um, resignation from the elections committee. I I think normally I would be completely on board with that, Miguel. My only concern is that the statement of their interest is so late in the elections cycle that that could open us up. Open us up so there should be a date there. Which is why I said a date uh -huh. and or um, yeah. uh, uh, an expression of candidacy. Yeah, it would have to be a date. Sarah, would you... Uh, would it be appropriate to add an individual who decides to run for executive council ceases, per ceases participation on the election committee no later than, and I'm asking for a date here. Uh, it, the bylaws folks have really been steeped in this. Do you have a re um, recommendation for a date? Um, March 1. March 15th? Yeah. Well, if if the senators need to be reported um, by March 1st, um, then I would I would think March 1st would be make it. April 1st, elections are gonna take place in March, right? Yes, yeah. that would be my recommendation. I was going to suggest April first, mm -hmm. so it matches. Yep, thank you. Can you help me with the language? So if yes, I strike the among among current senators, I strike that. If we say then an individual that decides to run for executive uh, council currently serving any elections committee must ceases, resign ceases participation on the election committee no later than. April 1st. Al, do we need to withdraw the motion and resubmit as a amended text? We might, but I want to let Sarah get this captured first. Okay. Okay. So an individual that decides to run for executive council currently serving on the elections committee ceases participation in elections committee by April 1st. Let's change that to must cease, and I think you've got it. Now, Sarah and Alan, are you willing to withdraw your motion to make yes. this change? I mean, I, how about accepting it as a friendly amendment? Friendly amendment, that's fine. Sarah, yes. are you amenable? Okay. Yes. Any further yes. discussion? <laughs> Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of adopting the proposed language as amended, Please raise your hands. Uh, John, please add Sarah. <laughs> yep. Uh, oops, still changing. Uh, 25. 25. Thank you very much. Please lower your hands, folks. All those opposed, all those opposed, please raise your hands. I'm oh, sorry, I don't, think, I don't think my hand worked. If you could add mine to the 26. Oh, yes, sir, we can. We will correct the record for 26 in support. Thank you. There is no opposition. Is there, are there any abstentions? No abstention, the motion carries without objection. Sarah, do you have any further amendments? I do, but in essence of time, I wanna just be mindful um, because I would like to put forward the student senator and then the changes we put for executive officer elections. 
Um, but I also want to be mindful that I don't want to rush this process um, and rush the discussion on this. So perhaps we will send this out again with other suggested language prior to the next meeting, or are you asking for another extension? Um, I can send this out for the April meeting. Okay, thank you. Could we include it as general orders? At the very beginning? Yes, please. We will consider that when we get the agenda items for the April meeting. Thank you, everyone. All right, really good work here today, folks. Uh, Nick, uh, there was no new business and the only Senate committee that had an update remaining was the elections committee that was scheduled for 10 minutes. We have a little more than two do you want to I can be really quick and okay. basically say that at this point in time, the elections committee recommends returning the issue of part time rep representation to the fall, the full Senate at our next meeting. Um, there's been quite a number of very nuanced in depth conversations and the in the process of drafting the language, the nuance and that complexities are pretty big. And I think it needs to be brought back to the entire Senate for a full discussion. Thank you. And I, I, I want to, in, uh, to be transparent after listening to several meetings between the elections committee and the bylaws committee, they are acting on my recommendation. Uh, this, is, this has gotten very complex and we need additional information and uh, this body needs to discuss this in more detail. So thank you. All right, uh, let me remind committee chairs that we now have a framework accepted. So we need to see the reports in our SharePoint uh, file for all committee reports. And then for our April meeting, we already have three items. Uh, we will discuss progress from campus concerns. Our April meeting will really be focused on the work that the Senate has done and identifying that work and making it clear to the college community. Uh, we have uh, Karen Hynek shared a draft of the dual enrollment policy. We requested that when the provost and Karen were at our meeting earlier. And so they have shared that. If we have questions, they will return. If we don't have questions, and uh, then it will not be on our agenda. And finally, uh, election results from campuses will be reported at our April meeting. With that, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn, Kirsten. Okay. I'll second. And seconded, thank you very much. I will assume there are no objections. However, Norley, if you could please stay on the call, I would appreciate that. Thank you very much for your work, folks, and I will see you next month. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Have a great weekend. Bye bye. Thanks, Al. Great meeting. Thank you. Bye, folks.